This is Cybert signing into Kane's Wrath on the map Forgotten Forest for the 2v2 quarterfinals A. So this is the quarterfinals video for the 2v2 World Championship. This is a little bit old, but I'm just now getting to the replays and we have got a lot of action to get into. So let's kick it off with our purple GDI player on the left side making up team number one. This is is Baggio. Their teammate as the blue Nod. This is Blackhand. Now they are playing Vanilla Nod, but their name is indeed Blackhand. Not to be too confusing there. On the right side as the green Nod. This is Drive. And his teammate as the Cyan GDI going fast tech. This is Futurama. Quarterfinals are best of fives. This is 1.02 plus release 16, and it looks like they are adhering to the same vanilla factions only rule from the 1v1 tournament. So quarterfinals are best of five, semis are best of sevens, and finals and the third place match are indeed best of nines. Now, if you win this game, you are not into the cash just yet. This prize pool is does have a pretty flat distribution. But with it being a 2v2 tournament, the money doesn't go as far because uh, the top four or six players, or four or six uh, players is only the first two or three teams. So in this case, first place gets 250, second place gets 150, and third place gets $100 split between them. So you have to get into that third place match to actually be able to get into the money. Looks like we have a bit of a flame tank, wrecking our rush, and an MCV push all coming in. Drive and Futurama, they are definitely the favored ones in this situation, and he doesn't have a Sonic emitter cue. That's really surprising. He's going right for a Reclamator into the front lines. The Reclamator hub gets dropped down, and that is going to be a great anchoring point for this army. Now, give credit to Blackhand and Baggio. They were able to shut down this Reckoner, keep that Blackhand squad and the Rocket squad away from the front line of the buildings. But the MCV is on the way, and now there probably is. No, there's still no Sonic Emitter cute. He's putting all of his cash right here. The Flame Tank is hanging out, waiting for those repairs that it's not quite getting just yet. Now, a couple of bikes coming through for uh, Drive. Going to be circling back around to that Reclamator Hub, and this is a hold-the-line position. He's going to be dropping a Hand of Nod, dropping a Shredder Turret as well. This is partially for body blocking, maybe not even for production. He's literally producing nothing for it. It's just to absorb a little bit of damage from Baggio and Black Hand, who are maybe faltering a little bit here. The response is going to be an Air Tower and Beam Cannons. You cannot go wrong with some beam cannons, but it's going to take a minute for them to really be effective, especially with this Marv on the way, ready to go. The MCV is here on the front lines. This is going to be a top hold no matter which way you slice it. A couple of bikes going to be coming through. They might actually be able to pick up this beam cannon almost for free. It's the beam cannon targeting down those bikes, but they do return to the north part of the battle. Mind Drop comes in. The Marv is going to be able to clean up some of those mines. And this Marv, I think, just has a single Zone Trooper in it. No additional Engineers or anything here just yet. And Flame Tank comes back in. The Flame Tank we all forgot about. And it's going to get up close and personal. He's going to go for the command for the Force Fire trick. But it doesn't quite burn anything down. He wasted a little bit too much time. But that may be okay because this gives more time for the Marv and the bikes to get up here to the front line. Laser turrets surrounding beam cannons four beam cannons if they could join their forces together they might be able to do something but a brilliant move by drive he unpacks his mcv to break the attack of that beam cannon beam cannons deal damage over time so the unpack or the repack unpack that he just pulled off broke that stream of damage coming in from those beam cannons and the engineer is going to barely maybe get it yes he does drive pulling off a heroic save of his own mcv to keep up the pressure to keep up the club which with he is bludgeoning Baggio and Black Hand, these two guys who are maybe outmatched in this fight are just being beaten down and stomped almost in an unfair way by Drive and Futurama, two of the top 1v1ers in the game right now, joining forces in this 2v2 team against some more like mid-level players and they are just not going easy on them. Black Hand Squad's directly to the front line. They're starting to burn down the con yard. And of course, if Black Hand and Baggio had been able to hold this off, 
had been able to push it away a little better. There really isn't much on the back end for Drive and Futurama. Everything is all in for this game. But of course, with the MCB position with the Marv, they can just expand out of this to kind of the left side of the map or maybe even backwards to the middle of the map. They can still pull something out of this as long as they have their con yards around. And good by Baggio's MCV. He does still have the War Factory, so technically he can stick around in this game a little longer, but I just don't see him producing very much at this point. It is dire straits one way or the other. Baggio has been defeated. It's all up to Black Hand. And it is going to be a tough hold. He's got no economy. He's got tech, but not much more than that. I don't know, maybe his thought was to try and get out a Redeemer or something. Go for the Rage Gen. Go for the long play. The War of Attrition, if you will. And uh, I just don't know that that is going to work. But for the current moment, he's still in this. He's building something out of his MCV. So Black Hand, he apparently has a path that he thinks will lead to victory. An obelisk is a good start to that. He does have economy up here. These harvesters have not been totally found out. They have not been destroyed, although they aren't necessarily going to be around for that much longer. The MCV4 drive is still here, and behind this he does have double refinery, four, no, five harvesters, although one of them is driving away from his base there. So he has got pretty okay economy, and, uh, you know, one base economy, but pretty okay nonetheless. Is he trying to go? Oh, he's going for the mine drop. Well, he keeps the air tower around. He might also be going for Venoms. Unfortunately, the Shredder turrets and the infantry are here to clean up the mine, so he does not get the massive mine drop on top of the Marv like he was hoping. War Factory going to be going down, potentially even just for the extra repairs to that Marv. And actually, base creeping with an op center so he can get the obelisks a little bit closer. He's going to be able to put out a couple of shots on that uh, on that Mar, but it's not quite going to be enough. Nice use. Black Hand dropping down the power plant, plant to body block for that obelisk. A great move there, but again, delay tactics, not really game winning tactics, which is a bit unfortunate for Black Hand. He has a lot of spirit. He has some fight left in him, but this is uh, close to an impossible situation going directly for the blue tib. Wanting to get even further ahead, Futurama is just going to power up in a kind of unconventional way. One refinery into Blue Tiberium is not really a build order that you see. And game number one, it's dragging out for a little while now, but a surprisingly explosive start. And, you know, you got to give it to Black Hand. He is not, he legitimately isn't throwing in the towel. I was going to say he's not just giving up, but he's actually drafting a Hand of Nod. Uh, not actually to produce anything, apparently. Uh, he's... Okay, there we go. Black Hand has been defeated. The GG gets called. Drive in Futurama. Take game one. But honestly, based on how they handled that absolute mayhem that poured upon their front door from minute one of this game, almost, how they handled that gives me hope that these guys are going to stand a chance against Drive and Futurama. We'll have to see what they bring for game number two, but I'm glad we have a best of five on our hands and not just a best of three. We have got at least three games in each one of these quarterfinals, so a minimum of 12 games and a maximum of 20. So let's see who goes into the semifinals by continuing on to game number two. Which takes us to Hurricane Lands for game number two. On the right side as the yellow GDI, this is Baggio. Their teammate as the blue Nod, this is Black Hand. Once again playing Nod and GDI, however in the south as the green Nod, this is Drive. And finally, with that screen representation as the Cyan, this is Futurama. Futurama and Drive, as I kind of alluded to in game number one, if this was 1v1, these two guys would be some of the top performers in this. But Baggio and Black Hand have an opportunity to show off their teamsmanship their ability to play and to collaborate as a team and to potentially outdo their uh, maybe upranked in uh, opponents as i mentioned this is the quarterfinals of the 2v2 world championship 
series. If you missed the 1v1s, those have all wrapped up. The VODs are on the channel. We've got quarterfinals in one big video, semis in other videos, and then the bronze on the finals in their own videos as well. And we're probably going to do the same thing. So quarterfinals. I might group semis together, but uh, probably split them apart. But uh, also, if you're new to Competitive Kane's Wrath or the channel, welcome. This is a little bit of an unusual event series. This particular event series had a $2,000 prize pool spread out technically between four tournaments. A beginner mid-level 1v1, a regular all-open 1v1, a 2v2, and a 3v3 event. So basically there was just a guy who said, I like Kane's Wrath, I like when people participate in tournaments, and I like watching games. So I'm going to sponsor basically four tournaments. And that's where this series came from. Now, if you're watching this as it comes out and you think, hey, I would like to get into Kane's Wrath, but maybe not a 1v1. Well, there is a 2v2 1.03 tournament, which is just a community patch that some people play. There is a $1,000 uh, 2v2 tournament coming up. It's in a couple of weeks from the point of when this comes out. It should be maybe a little under two weeks. So, I believe it's random teams, which I think means you just uh, get assigned a team. You just have to sign up. And yeah, you get a shot at some tournament experience, at some prize money. You get an opportunity, and again, I think, I forget the guy who, uh, who sponsored that one. But uh, I, it looks like it's just a guy who was like, I don't know, I want to spend $1,000 to see some cool Kane's Wrath action and support the community and do all of that kind of stuff. So this is actually a really good year for Kane's Wrath in that sense. A lot of people have just been putting their own money on the line. We don't have million-dollar prize pools from EA because EA abandoned us long, long ago. They abandoned us in terms of official support. They abandoned us in terms of online support with GameSpy dying years ago. And the community has carried on. All Command & Conquer games have community-supported tournaments and action. I shouldn't say all. I don't know if Tib Sun does. All the other ones do. Maybe not Tib Twilight as well. Bike's going to be coming in here for Drive. He's going to be able to pick up a Harvester kill pretty easily. No, he doesn't get the Harvester kill. He decides to pull out. He's going to... It's, boo, he might as well have committed with how much he's taken damage. He loses all four of those bikes, and Baggio actually keeps the Harvester alive. That's one of those moments where he thought he was going to be able to escape with some of those bikes if he pulled off a moment earlier, but it just didn't work out. And so he didn't want to suicide the bikes, but he ended up losing the bikes anyways. A little bit unfortunate there for Drive. He's now going to be showing up with some, uh, I don't know, I guess that was a one click of some kind, but he dropped it on the command post, doing some damage, maybe even burning down a refinery as well. Seeker Tank's going to be coming in for Futurama, showing us that Skrin firepower and even going to be dropping the repair drones directly onto the front line. Going to be able to overwhelm a couple of pit bulls that pop out of the War Factory. Unfortunately for Baggio, he just doesn't have the firepower on the front lines to be able to deal with this. Even a lightning spike going to be adding insult to injury, making this even more difficult. Bike's going to be showing up for Blackhand, and this may be the saving grace of Baggio. The bikes should be able to overwhelm at least some of these Seeker Tanks, and having the Watchtower there to put out a little bit of extra gun damage is certainly nice. Reinforcing Seeker Tanks getting cut off by Watchtowers and by bikes. A combination defense here from Blackhand and Baggio who are going to be able to pull together to stop these Seeker Tanks. And honestly, the Seeker Tanks, they cleaned up some Pit Bulls. They cleaned up... Oh, now they're getting the Harvesters. So this is the this is where it starts to become really problematic as Baggio loses his natural expansion, as he loses his mid-game economy. This is where things might start to snowball out of control for him. You can generally still button up, tighten your defenses, and try and play from behind in a defensive way. But it's going to become tougher and tougher with guys like Drive and Futurama who generally put on the gas and they're going to have artillery pounding at your doorstep before you're really ready for it. So already upgrades starting to come in, force attenuated force fields on these Seeker tanks to give them that extra bit of armor. And Futurama may not even be letting off the gas for a moment. Drive, on the other hand, he's got a little pocket of infantry in the middle of the map and in the southern section of the map as well. But he's not necessarily moving across the map and doing anything with them just yet. Seeker tanks coming back in, targeting down the harvesters, kind of splitting their damage between the APCs and the harvesters. 
and here they go no more defenses slowly but surely scorpion tanks going to be coming in here and that may actually be enough this is a good number of scorpion tanks the bikes as well going to be trying to chase down these seeker tanks and losing more harvesters on the front line never feels good for Baggio. He's got no economy behind this, so all of his eco is here at his natural expansion where he's got four harvesters whirring away, but it's just been a long road to go to try and get that natural expansion up and running. Drive, on the other hand, also uh, maybe a little bit lackluster on his expansion. He, he is, I'm not actually sure what Drive has been doing this entire time. He's now going to get a couple of Black Hand squads chased down by two flame tanks from Black Hand, which is uh, mildly confusing to say considering the flame tanks are from Black Hand and the Black Hand squads are from Drive. But Drive isn't driving the flame tanks. He's walking the Black Hand squads. But anyways, Bike's now going to be coming in. One Black Hand squad did manage to escape. And who wins in a fight between Black Hand Squads and Bikes? It might actually be the Black Hand Squad. Oh my gosh, they are tearing through those bikes. Man, the armor on the bikes is just paper thin. It might as well be literal paper, paper with how quickly they burned through those units. Black Hand up to Tier 3. He's got that Tib Catalyst missile ready as well. So I don't know if we're going to see a holographic scout coming in at some point. Who he's going to choose to uh, try and bust with that with that tip catalyst missile it does get spotted by drive so he ids it and he even sees it out with the venom shooting it a little bit there and of course the armor is so weak on that uh tip catalyst or on that tip chemical plant that uh the venom is actually doing a serious amount of damage no refineries have been struck down just yet the chemical plant down to almost half hp which is a little bit problematic there for our nod friend and uh, eventually he's going to scare away that Sam site, or scare away that Venom with a Sam site. A couple, uh, couple of Scorpion tanks dying to the Mind Drop. That was a lovely placed Mind Drop just to kind of disrupt these Scorpions as soon as they start to move out from that position. Hammerhead with a Rifleman inside of it. AP ammo going to be a big benefit to these units. A Flame Tank going to be coming through, and here... He might be looking for the Catalyst Missile, although hitting the main base refineries wouldn't necessarily be the best use of a Catalyst Missile. And that's a stealth flame tank, by the way, so a stealth field was used on it. That's why nothing is attacking it at the current moment, how it was able to sneak through the defenses. And unfortunately, that flame tank is going to get found out and destroyed. Not a whole lot of advantage gained by that flame tank. Vertigo Bomber is going to be coming in to deal with the Hammerheads. And, of course, they've got that little Tail Gunner, which 99% of the time we never see the Tail Gunner get utilized on the Vertigo Bombers. But in this case, they're actually going to claim one Hammerhead, just slowly chasing those guys away. Might even drop their bombs on. Actually, the Chemical Plant going to get the kill on the Chemical Plant, force the sell-off of it. And it looks like both Vertigo Bombers will actually escape. They could even go for that additional Hammerhead as well. And Futurama has macroed up a huge army. He put on the pressure early on, and then he backed way off, and he just built up a giant army back home. Tripods are here, and look at that. Even Drive going to be getting there with a uh, with a holographic army on the front line. Shardwalker is going to be stepping around the side. Gunwalker is rather stepping around the side, and this is just so much firepower without much of an answer from Baggio. And this is where things get really problematic. He's got EMP grenades, but the force fields are going to help deal with that. Even a buzzer hive going down on the front line to just easily bust through that grenadier squad. And I feel like I keep hearing the uh, the commando little sound effect there. But, I mean, tripods aren't dying, so I'm mishearing things. A couple of avatars show up for Black Hand, but this is just power overwhelming for Futurama. Tip Bang Detonation fires off, catching a couple of these tripods, but not actually killing any of them. And this is just an overwhelming, crushing force crashing through the front door of Baggio and now really Black Hand as Baggio leaves the game. And this was just a game of they got ahead and then they just got further and further ahead. Tib Vane, uh, Tib Vapor Bomb gets dropped and a Catalyst Missile gets called in, but really ineffectual weapons against this kind of an army. And Black Hand, once again, he's sticking in the game. 
but he has no plan for how to win this. We saw a couple of nice moves attempted by Black Hand in this match, but he never had the follow-up to really make it work. Baggio got slapped right in the beginning of the game, and he was staggering for the rest of the match to try and keep up. And we see that there even on the economy graph. Futurama way out ahead and Drive lagging behind. I mean, we saw that Drive did not have a lot of units. I'm not sure what his deal was throughout that game. I guess there at the end he sort of exploded. But uh, I think that was all infantry. Not necessarily heavy hitting high tech units. Once again, Drive and Futurama pretty much dominating in game number two. Well, Black Hand and Baggio, they've got one more chance to try and bring this back and save their hopes of going into the semifinals. <laughs> Which takes us to unsound investment for game number three. As the blue nod, this is Black Hand. And as the yellow GDI, this is Baggio. Meanwhile, in the south, this time as the green GDI, this is Drive. And as the Cyan Nod across the ridge, although he has a, he has a power plant and barracks in his base, this is Futurama. So Futurama and Drive have switched places, and of course, blue on Nod looks purple in-game. But, uh, but on the minimap, it looks blue. It just looks so purple on all of the buildings. And then you look at it next to the purple, and you're like, oh, I guess the other purple is purple. But it looks so purple. Blue, purple, who cares? But we do have... Uh... Huh. I would describe this as a weird build coming out from Drive. Okay, he is fast-teching to an airfield in Futurama's base. So he's got the... He doesn't have AP ammo on the way. Oh my gosh, and he's going to combat support airfield as... And he sold his MCV! He's got literally nothing in his own base. He drafted like one squad into the bunker, and this is their clincher for game number three. He's got the tip spike down here, so a little bit of income over the course of this game. He's got his initial cash and then that extra bit from the tip spike, and that is pretty much it. And it's into flame tanks. He actually sells off the command post as well. So that is uh, that is a tough break. Oh no, and a Reckoner coming in from Black Hand. Baggio, on the other hand, he's playing pretty standard. He's got pit bulls, he's got economy getting up and running, but he is not necessarily going to be ready for Orcas and flame tanks to be coming in. The Orc is coming in to Baggio's base as the Reckoner shows up in Drive's original base and is like, what is going on? The Orcas have now been spotted. The jig is up. And I think these guys are kind of figuring out what's going on. There's going to be a sensor drop pod to reveal these harvesters. One harvester goes down very nicely controlled there by Drive. Doesn't want to waste any kind of extra rockets. Wants to get ma maximum damage out of these Orcas. Wastes a couple of rockets there, and the Pitbulls are here to try and push away these Orcas at the same time. And there is actually going to go the Reckoner to kill off the Warp. They went and the, oh my gosh, the airfield goes down. Drive, he has got himself a barracks, and that is pretty much it. No more production out of that airfield, and that is not what he was planning for this game to get wrecking or rushed and clean up that airfield. This game should be over qu very quickly, one way or the other. But Futurama loses another flame tank. Baggio rushing back and forth left and right. He's lost his war factory. He may be losing. Uh, no, he won't lose the refinery. The flame tank goes down instead, but he's got no war factory. He's got economy, but no war factory pro to produce anything. He's just going to have to rely on what he's already got out on the field. Might even draft a barracks just to get out some additional units. Bunch of beacons are going down. That stealth reveal as Futurama. Futurama says, hey, there's a refinery here, and I think that's really it 
for Black Hand. Yeah, the refinery. Oh, the engineer! The engineer grabbed the refinery! I completely missed that. Drive stole the refinery from Black Hand. So Black Hand is completely dead unless he's got three grand to pull up another refinery and now sneaking in the back door Futurama and Drive are here to burn down another refinery and another war factory. Pick your poison, either lose your production or lose your economy. Either one is bad news, both is even worse news as Baggio's pit bulls show up a little bit too late to the party and these flame tanks have already done incredible damage. Futurama, who is doing some kind of an awkward expansion into the corner, going for a secret shrine, going for a blue Tiberium expansion, has just completely destroyed almost everything that these players have. Baggio has been defeated. Hands everything over to Blackhand, and Blackhand is going to try and pull something out from here, but I don't even know if he has... I don't even know if he has anything. Does he have any cash? Does he have anything at all? Blackhand has nothing Nod left. Uh, he may have some Nod units, but he just lost the last Nod power plant, so everything from Nod is gone, it looks like. Unless his MCV managed to escape somewhere, but I don't think it did. And this is just uh, tough. A uh, tough situation, whichever way you cut it. This is a bad, bad situation. Uh, Drive is, I guess, technically still in this game. Yeah, he's got himself some rocket squads coming out. He's got some riflemen coming out as well, circling around the south side of the map. And Futurama is just going for mass infantry, which, hey, against Pitbulls, who should do fantastic against the crush of these Harvesters. It's actually doing pretty well as well. Two Harvesters go down. The unit control is not great from Blackhand. And so as a result, he's losing three Harvesters, crushing only a handful of Rocket Squads. Not nearly as many Rocket Squads as he would have liked. Not nearly as quickly as he would have liked. And he just does not pull off as clean of an execution of stopping that attack as he would like. He's still got a couple of Harvesters here, and thank goodness Black Hand has two additional Harvesters full of Tiberium from the other side of the ridge. And now he's, of course, got those two uh, two tip spikes, three tip spikes, actually. So 30 credits a second. That's adding up. That's uh, maybe half a Harvester worth of income over the course of a minute. And uh, an Engineer is going to be rushing to the front line as well. Drive may honestly be able to get that Engineer into somewhere because Black Hand is so distracted doing something else. Futurama's actually got a pretty good setup, all things considered. Drive is going to be defending Futurama's Harvesters, and without even pulling his Harvesters, microwing, or anything, Drive completely defends Futurama's Harvester. Futurama doesn't lose a single Harvester, and that is a good friend if I have ever seen one. This engineer now going to be heading to the other side of the map. I'm guessing he's going for a Tib Spike capture, which he may very well be able to do. More Rocket Squads coming out for Futurama. Rocket Squads and Riflemen heading to the front line for Drive. And this may be a bit of a combo move where they just take uh, take this little position by force. Just using Rocket Squads to bludgeon down the door and break into the base of Blackhand. Blackhand, who has a decent number of watchtowers. I mean, watchtowers can be overwhelmed with a couple of Rocket Squads. So watchtowers aren't some kind of and all be all certainly this engineer is still heading north trying to keep an eye on him as this game comes to a close and well blackhand he's going to try and pull something out going into an airfield is a very curious move uh it does definitely give him the mobility to potentially pick off bits of this army here and there Beacon going to be going off there as Drive pokes in for just a moment. He's going to try and dig in with some rifleman squads, and he's going to dig in with three or four of them, maybe even five or six, and Hammerheads were the choice. Grenadiers into the Hammerheads, but unfortunately, Black Hand doesn't have the time to keep that refined, to keep that airfield up and working much longer. And AP ammo is great. The Grenadier is an excellent choice here, but it's just like... 30 seconds too late if he had been able to get that airfield up sooner and had another minute or two to produce out with those hammerheads. He would have had a pretty decent force of hammerheads to pick off some of this infantry army before it ever gets there. Black Hand Squad going to be flaming down one tip spike while Drives Engineer captures the other tip spike. The APCs pretty much all going down. Even the Harvester may be taking some damage. No, it does manage to escape unscathed. 
but this position hasn't been broken. The Grenadiers haven't even been able to push away these units in these foxholes, and Futurama still just has free reign of the map to do whatever he wants, which honestly isn't all that much. This map is a little bit spread out, a little bit weird with the eco, the way it's uh, distributed around the map. He went for the blue field, and I think he was expecting Black Hand to fold a little bit easier, but Black Hand has been putting up a fight. Black Hand has been trying to uh, to stay in this game, and it's going to be even tougher as these flame tanks roll into his base, burn down his war factory, burn down his refinery, and this is where having aircraft to ward this off early would have been fantastic, but of course it is not meant to be. Black Hand goes down 0-3. Baggio and Blackhand drop out of the 2v2 World Championship. Drive and Futurama step in to the semifinals with a very convincing series. Baggio and Blackhand, I felt like, were on the cusp of having a shot at this series, but every single game tipped against them. I mean, game number one is uh, is kind of a give me for Drive and Futurama because that was such a bizarre thing to face and something that they were not at all prepared for. And then the other games, Blackhand definitely putting up a fight and, and trying to stick around in it and trying to carve out some kind of path to victory, but ultimately Futurama and Drive were just too too good for it. So let us, having concluded our first semi quarterfinal, let us see who else goes into the top half of the semifinals with our second quarterfinal series. And that takes us to Hurricane Lands once again, but this time for game number one in the North our team with the red GDI player, this is Space. Their ally as the purple nod, this is Prime White. Our team in the south as the green, as the yellow GDI, this is Shock Trepid. And as the green nod, this is Eclipse. Eclipse and Shock Trepid versus Space and Prime White. I actually don't know who Prime White is. This might be uh, Jake White and Space teaming up together, in which case I think they definitely have a shot. Space is certainly a good player, but if Space is having an off day, then I feel like Eclipse and Shock Trepid, especially their powers combined, are going to be a formidable force. Shock Trumpet and Eclipse, both, uh, you know, like top four kind of players in their own right. Shock Trumpet may be a little bit more commonly in Tib Wars than in Kane's Wrath, but he's certainly a force to be reckoned with in Kane's Wrath. And Prime White, I am just unsure about. They are sort of the, I don't know, the wild card coming into this. If they're Jake White, then we can definitely potentially see some good games out of them. But, uh,. I don't know that Space and Prime White is as strong of a team as Eclipse and Shock Trepid. Sometimes you see some 2v2 shenanigans that surprise you. But uh, that last series was not so much that. Actually, no, we did see some stuff that surprised us. But Futurama and Drive were still the ones who won. So that result was unsurprising. But the, the method in which they got there. Eclipse is honestly letting his MCV take a lot of damage. Uh, for basically free. It does keep that pit bull from shooting other stuff, but honestly, this is a scouting pit bull. It's, this is not a multi pit bull attack, so the fact that he got some free damage off on that MZV, I feel like, is a win. I guess you could always play the, like, what if game, and it's like, well, maybe he would have gotten a harvester. He's not going to get a harvester. If he gets a harvester, that's even funnier than the amount of damage that he did on that MCV. Eclipse expands to the north, could just be into fast tech. We'll have to see how Eclipse wants to play out his version of Nod. But uh, on the other side, you know, one Nod, one GDI player, and could just be one clicks all around. It could be both players are sort of relying on GDI to get up to artillery, get that juggernaut, railgun, big, tough, hard-to-kill army. And then Nod is going to be like, hey, we're going to fast tack. We're going to try and shut down Eco. We're going to go for the harass stuff. For now, everyone's kind of playing it straight up macro. No specialized builds like we saw in game number one of that last series. That last series really was uh, almost a series of specialized builds. I guess not so much game two. Game two was uh, pretty much just like a, let's go kill the other guys. 
with normal builds kind of game. Three watchtowers all going down for space and then having to sell all of them off. Loses the harvester as well, so space's mid-game economy definitely hampered here as he is uh, not going to be happy about losing his first harvester out on his natural expansion. Shock Trepid up to two refineries and three harvesters in total. So Space and Prime White definitely faltering in this first sort of set of engagements. Space was able to do some damage to the MCV, but of course that isn't followed up with anything, so that damage isn't of particular consequence. Bikes are going to commit to the attack. They're going to go for the Harvester. The Juking is good. It's going to be the Scorpion Tanks probably that finish off that Harvester. And actually, this bike, if it gets one more shot off, it barely does manage to kill that Harvester, but not before everything gets cleaned up by Eclipse and Shock Trap. It's Scorpion Tanks from Eclipse and Pitbulls from Shock joining forces to push back Space and Prime White. They paid pretty dearly for that one Harvester kill. Wasn't necessarily as bad as it could have been, but that was not the quick and easy Harvester kill that they were probably hoping for. And now turning north, Eclipse and Shock Trepid are going to be going once again for the throat of space. He's got a couple of Predator tanks here, but it's probably going to be requiring some reinforcements coming in from space or from uh, Prime White. Actually, space going to be bringing in his own reinforcement, Pitbulls, around the north side of that ridge and forcing Eclipse to go into a more defensive mode instead of offensive, which, he wa which is what he was doing. And well, it is nice to have, sh to have hidden harvesters doing your scouting for you. I assume Catalyst Missile is about to fire off uh, it did fire off, but it was actually up here at Space's refinery, not down here where the, where the hidden harvesters are scouting for Eclipse. So that was, a, that was a bit of a surprise to fire off up in the north there. But that is where you cut off Space and you continue to hamper his eco. Space has been trying to set something up for the entirety of this game, and he has just been faltering a little bit here. Hammerhead's going to be showing up. Laser turret as well to help push away these scorpion tanks. And three scorpion tanks dying on the retreat. Never what you want as the Nod player to be losing those reinforcements from your, in theory, you know, nice quick attack and then uh, pull back. Pitbulls are a little bit late to the party. They may be able to pick up a couple of shots on these hammerheads as they retreat. Ooh, Shock Trepid, good enough to keep his hammerheads out of range of those pit bulls and not letting the weakened hammerhead get cycled to the front line to take the damage. The game of Contain continues. Eclipse going up to the Redeemer, about to get out his epic unit, and it's going to be Catalyst Missiles on both sides. But Shock Trepid, I feel like, has had better economy established for longer to be able to take the brunt of something like a, uh, a Catalyst missile firing down upon you. Redeemer steps out for Eclipse. Engineer and uh, Black Hand most likely going to be the choice. He's got four avatars to stand along with that Redeemer as the radar jamming missile fires off as well. Prime White going possibly for his own Redeemer. Maybe a little bit late to the party, but no Reclamator Hub on the map for, I think, either of our GDI players. Instead, just still sticking around with that uh, with that airfield. Jack Trepic going to be able to find an additional almost two Predator tank kills, one and a half Predator tank kills. As the Redeemer steps up to the front line, Rage Gen fires off, and the Pitbulls are going to be taking the damage from that goodbye anti air as the supersonic airstrike catches almost everything. The, the hammerheads crash to the ground just as they execute an, in theory, almost perfect attack against those Pitbulls. Shockwave artillery, the RNG barely misses. Oh, that Redeemer escaping, but the GDI forces getting hit by their own shockwave artillery and even the Harvester taking a little bit of damage from that Orca strike as it was placed. That RNG working against you when you're space, you fire off that shockwave artillery, you're hoping to capture that that uh, Redeemer and do some free damage while it's locked down. And the result is instead you catch your own units with it and the Redeemer escapes. The money is completely wasted in every sense. 
Laser capacitors are up and running. It looks like a, a couple of Scorpion tanks getting eaten up by those Predator tanks. Once again, Rage Gen firing off, causing havoc amongst Space and Prime White, who honestly have done a pretty good job of keeping hold of their forces, but have not been able to actually do what they want with them, partially because of that Rage Gen disrupting them. And they've just managed to keep stuff alive, not managed to do real damage with it. Rage Gen fires off. The Predator tanks ignoring it for now. For the most part, they had a command already given for a couple of seconds there. And then a nuclear missile gets constructed. So we have the potential of, well, actually, Scorpion tanks sneaking through the back line there. Kind of funny. But uh, Juggernaut's also going to be getting in on the action to try and knock down those obelisks. Meanwhile, Shock Traffic continues to press forward with his Predator tanks not doing a whole lot, but certainly distracting their opponent and not necessarily doing too much more than that space, cleaning up whatever that was quite considerably. He's still firing on the ground there, trying to avoid the Rage Gen as this obelisk firing off one shot on one of those Predator tanks from the Rage Gen as the Avatars chase down the Redeemer and the Predator tanks just take a beating from those Juggernauts. Juggernaut's cleaning up Predator tanks from that kind of a range almost isn't fair, but the Predator tanks have finally closed the distance that's up to the Avatars to protect the Jugs as the Predator tanks walk into a death trap and everything dies. Predator tanks on the north side from Shock Trepid still trying to find their angle, trying to find their opening. He's just been driving around constantly. He's going to be losing two Predator tanks to the Juggernaut there as they actually get the surround on this Juggernaut and they may eventually kill something. They haven't killed very much, but they have certainly been a distraction and a thorn in the side of Space and Prime White. Finally, the no, this is actually Prime White's Redeemer. It's just going to be taking damage from the Juggernauts as the Avatars, the Redeemer, the Rocket Squads, and the Hammerheads all pounce. Prime White loses his Redeemer without doing hardly anything with it. Rage Gen fires off as Vertigo Bombers trying to clear out the Juggernauts don't find much success. This Redeemer going to absorb a couple of shots there, but it's not enough to stay alive, and the Orca is now going to be going for the Juggernauts themselves. Unfortunately, the stealth is keeping them hidden from space, who is not having a good time trying to hit his enemy's artillery. Those Juggernauts avoiding those Orcas. Oh man, orbital bombardment directly on top of the Jugs as Shockwave Artillery fires off on the other side. It's a massacre on both sides as even the Husks get destroyed by that orbital bombardment. Shockwave Artillery possibly firing off or an Orca strike. No, it's going to be a tip vapor bomb to clean up the rest. Spectre Artillery firing over the tops, trying to clean out the Avatars and it's absolute mayhem as Eclipse and Shock Trepid are desperately trying to push forward, getting two more Juggernauts as the Orcas come in, but it's not enough firepower to stop this onslaught to stop this attack as two more avatars and a juggernaut go down to the vertigo bombers the specter artillery somewhere still firing from the back lines but it may be the only thing that prime white still has in this fight he's got the obelisk to try and hold the line but everything else has been eliminated Someone just got out another Redeemer. It looks like it's not Prime White. Orca Strike, I think, getting called in on that Space Command uplink. He's going to be able to do some damage to the Space Command uplink. Almost gets the destroy on it. Doesn't quite clean it up. Pitbull's going to be showing up. Orbital Bombardment on top of these Juggernauts. A great one-two punch. Can the Pitbulls actually finish them off? It's going to be up to the Obelisks to get the winning kills on these juggernauts a couple of juggernauts still standing as eclipse redeemer makes its way back to the front line and it's not enough firepower even shock trepid getting in on the laser action capitalizing on an avatar husk and uh, getting some shots off on that obelisk prime white and space getting pushed back from the front line vertigo bombers coming in once again goodbye space command uplink and the sonic boom cleans out two one of the Vertigo Bombers, another one gets cleaned up by the Pit Bulls, and 2 minutes 45 left on the nuclear missile of Eclipse. 
Shockwave on the front line. That sonic airstrike may have cleaned up some of the vertigos, but it did nothing to stop the rest of this attack. Tungsten Shell is going to be firing off on those hammerheads, but it's not enough to stop the onslaught. The attack continues. It's Juggernauts versus Juggernauts. Three Juggernauts going down in a lucky strike as Space gets the killing blow on multiple Jugs at one time, but his own Jugs completely undefended against the aircraft. And that AA battery just slightly out of position. It will claim one hammerhead. It will claim two and three hammerheads as they do evac from the front line. And Prime White bolsters his front line defenses with militant squads. He's really just trying to buy time for the obelisk, buy time for his redeemer, which I assume he's trying to get out, but desperately not quite able to. The MCV once again getting cloaked by the disruption tower of Eclipse, and Prime White's MCV falls immediately preceding his Redeemer being created. One and a half minutes left on that nuclear missile. Another Rage Gen fires off, trying to disrupt the front line of Eclipse and Shock Trepid, who now have their own obelisks on the front line. And this is like the attack that just never stopped. Pulling back from the onslaught, they're dealing with these pit bulls that are coming in for space. Space, I assume, going for that nuclear silo, but not quite being able to zero in on it and take it down. Space has been defeated. Prime White has been defeated one minute before the nuke went off as the shockwave artillery zeroed in on that Redeemer. The GG is called, and game number one goes to Eclipse and Shock Trepid, but that was a close game overall. It was not close in a lot of the individual fights, but the fact that Space and Prime White did such a good job of staying neck and neck despite getting slapped down from the beginning and feeling like they were at a disadvantage for much of that time, they did a really good job of trying to stay on even footing and holding off Eclipse and Shock Trepid. If Eclipse and Shock Trepid play that same way, Space and Prime White might be able to find a, a better defensive setup to be able to deal with those two. And let's see how they do in game number two. Which takes us to the always popular forgotten forest on the left side in the northern position as the green nod. This is Eclipse. As the yellow GDI, this is Shock Trepid. Those two guys feeling pretty good about their 1-0 lead, but this is a best of five. And on the right side, as the red scram, this is space. Their teammate as the purple nod, this is prime white. We're getting to see our complimentary scrin action. We'll have to see. This could be a, a a play to go for, like, big eco, big expansion. Uh, this map does have a decent amount of money, especially with the double fields. They're pretty generous. And then you've got the uh, sort of big central fields in the middle. But Skrin could be, you know, utilizing uh, the drone ship to fly over, go for some kind of double expand. You know, Prime White goes to the south, the drone ship goes to the north, or even to this expansion. They could be trying something like that, or he's just a big believer in the power of Skrin. After losing a game, he decides to change up his faction, switch things over to that Skrin. So far on the left side of the map, things are looking pretty straightforward. Pretty standard, scouting buggy comes in, Prime White confirms. Yeah, everything is pretty typical. Although the other thing is, I wonder if Space is thinking that it would be really nice to have a stasis shield for defensive purposes. Some of those fights would have definitely gone a bit differently if you had a, uh, a stasis there to, uh, to, to lock down your opponent's units. 
Prime White, as you may have seen, utilizing his buggy to mess with the pathing of the MCV. As you can see, it kind of blocks off the MCV. Sometimes the MCV can just kind of glitch through it successfully or path around it, but the buggy will sometimes block off the MCV and delay that expansion from coming up, which also meant that the MCV was already unpacked by the time the descents got close. They're going to go for the crush on this MCV. They get one shot off. And not much more than that. The Watchtower comes online. The APC and the Pitbulls are here. And a pretty easy cleanup for Eclipse and Shock Trepid. Although their expansion may be slightly delayed from when they intended to be down there. I don't know that that's necessarily a big deal in any case. No double expand from Space and Prime White. Instead, it's just pretty straightforward. Pretty standard, all things considered. Space going to be expanding off of the build radius from Prime White. He's got his refinery there. He's got his two harvesters already up and running. And other than that, you know, he's, he's just developing quite normally, all things considered. Possibly some shard launchers, some attenuated force fields in the future, and then maybe just some of those classic Scrin one-clicks. Prime White was trying to do the sneaky thing and steal the Blue Tiberium, but he got caught a little bit with his pants down. Eclipse and Shock Trepid getting some free damage on that Harvester, and they're going to try and roll this into a bit of an attack. Not necessarily enough firepower here to push forward and actually do anything, but they might try and trade out. The Lightning Spike that makes that a little bit more difficult. But hey, if you get a load or two of Blue Tiberium out of the exchange, then it almost certainly was worth it as long as you trade pretty evenly with your opponent. You're keeping their numbers down, they're keeping your numbers down, you're both sort of committing there in the center of the map, but you get the Tiberium out of the deal. That's always nice to have. A couple of Seeker tanks pushing forward. Maybe a bit of a mistake as he decides to reverse move them immediately. Pitbulls and attack bikes coming in to the north. There are some dev tanks here to try and deal with this, but no base defenses to try and push this away. Of course, the lightning spike was already used in the south, so it can't be used now as the dev tanks, three of them completely overwhelmed and destroyed. One harvester may be going down as well. There are a couple of harvesters still here on full health, but... Well, the dev tanks were the real victims of that attack. Prime White and Space holding off that attack. And uh, the dev tanks were pretty much the only losses. Down here, Tib Catalyst Missile fires off, cleans up one refinery, misses the second refinery. Does a bit of damage to the harvesters, but not too much, all things considered. Space should be able to recover from that. It is definitely going to slow him down, and it puts his economy not where he wanted it for this stage of the game. Uh-oh, Prime White getting overwhelmed by the forces of Eclipse. Who's got more bikes and buggies? It turns out the answer is Eclipse in this case. Refineries in the north. One of them could be uh, sold off, and one of the harvesters could be transitioned over for space. As he is, uh, he's looking pretty thin in the north. He might want to stick around for just a minute longer. Seeker tanks pushing forward, going for that bike buggy exchange once again. Prime White in the south. He's got the holographic army to absorb some of the shots from the rocket squads and the predator tanks. There's a little two-pronged attack. I don't know that it's going to work out super well. No, it has not worked out at all. Space gets, space gets completely smashed in the north. And when you've taken this kind of damage, it can be hard to pull off an attack to immediately follow that up. The Harvester's trying to juke around the building and escape the Scorpion tanks. One Harvester will not escape, the other one getting close, and the Scorpion tanks are going to commit to the attack. They're going to go in for it and then just trade out against the APCs, trying to cover their own Harvester's action at the same time as the, well, the Eradicator Hexapod is on its way. The Warp Chasm here in the north that will be spotted by these Tib Core bikes and by the buggies as well as the tripods look to push away those forces, but they almost certainly did scout that, yes, there is a Warp Chasm, there is an Eradicator Hexapod on the way, and the late game is here. The Eradicator Hexapod possibly teleporting around the map in and out of bad situations. We'll have to see how much is actually done with that Eradicator Hexpawn.
Eclipse taking the map, the expansion in the middle. Love that position for him. The expansions in the south have been a little bit spread out in weird ways. No double refinery down south for Eclipse. He's instead keeping his economy up in the north. The Eradicator Hexpod is here with a single Corruptor, and it's going to be up to the Obelisk and the Rocket Squads to try and lock this down. EMP coils have been purchased for the Raider Buggies, so there is the opportunity for them to come in here and lock down this Eradicator Hexpod, allowing the Obelisk to do, to do some extra damage. Radar jamming missile fires off once more. And a flame squad, a black hand squad, trying to cut down this Tiberium spike, burn it to the ground. A single buggy swinging in to do some potential harassment in the south. Devastator warship gets eliminated very quickly there by those bikes. You don't want to land, let that artillery just stick around. EMP takes out a couple of the force fields on those tripods, but the other tripod going to be stepping forward, and it does go down, but it gets some lovely crushes. Probably not enough to be worth it. There's a storm column going down on the front line to try and cover the attack of these Devastator warships and the Eradicator Hexpod as it stomps its way to the front line. Scorpion tanks. Prime White and Space finally joining forces together as Eclipse is going to pull together his bikes. And it looks like in the south, Shock Trepid is maybe coming to the aid. No, he's actually reverse moving away from the middle of the map as the Tip Vane detonation goes off, shutting down possibly all of the bike buggy from Eclipse. And Eclipse doesn't have much on the front line to answer. And Eradicator Hexpod with this much healing, the tripods and the shot, the uh, Devastate her warships as well. A couple of the corruptors going to be getting caught by that tip vein detonation, but even the tripods weather the storm, and the Eradicator Hexpod is, of course, okay with that kind of a one click being utilized on it. The front line of Eclipse has been broken. No, uh, no reinforcements to get him out of this trouble. The Marv and the Predators, the Juggernauts as well, in the south for Shock Trepid not necessarily going to be able to save Eclipse in this moment. Eclipse is, I think, just buying time, trying to uh, maybe delay the inevitable a bit, even calling on that radar jamming missile just to disrupt your opponents. Predator Tanks for Shock Trepid actually going to find an opening in the back door of Prime White, maybe even get a refinery or a couple of harvesters pretty much for free. They're going to shut down a War Factory, possibly the Tier 3. They might get a lot of damage done, and this attack in the north that is going to destroy Eclipse may not be the only real damage done at this moment. Predator Tanks going to be targeting down harvesters. There isn't a lot of cash left in the southern part of the map. But uh, at the same time, these main bases have been pretty empty for most of the time. Action exploding all over the place as Marv and the Juggernauts trying to engage with these avatars. But this Marv is actually revealing its rear armor to these avatars, which are going to be going down to the Juggernauts, which get eliminated possibly by the Spectre artillery. And this avatar is trying to get away from the Marv. At the same time, the Eradicator Hexpod making its way south, having carved its way all the way through the north. These Predator tanks and the bike buggy still a presence in the south, and they're even going to force the sell off of the tech lab. Everything in that natural expansion getting shut down for both players as they are going to be getting consolidated towards the middle of the map. Shock Trap, it has been defeated. Eclipse have been defeated. Space and Prime White even the score up one to one with a crush through the front door. Space utilizing that Scrin battering ram, the Eradicator Hexapod, to bust his way into a map to victory. Prime White holding off Shock Trepid's reinforcements in the south and then swinging through to, uh, well, attempt to do something with his avatars and his redeemer. But again, just holding Shock Trepid off, stopping Eclipse and Shock Trepid from being able to join forces and stop space. And space just went crazy with that Eradicator Hexpod and those Corruptors in the north. So I'm curious to see... Having Game 2 go to Space and Prime White, are they going to continue this nod screen powerhouse combo? Or will Shock Trepid and Eclipse choose to change things up as well? Let's find out in Game number 3. Who breaks the tie? Who gains the advantage in this series? Which takes us to Downtown Dust Bowl. The four-player variant of Tournament Dust Bowl. 
in the north as the purple nod. This is Prime White. And on the left side as the red screen, this is Space. Our second team as the yellow GDI, this is Shock Trepid. And as the green nod, this is Eclipse. Nod GDI for Eclipse, Nod Scrin for Space and Prime White. So uh, Shock Trepid and Eclipse choosing not to change things up. They are believers in what won them game number one in their classic formula, if you will. Meanwhile, Space and Prime White, they are also loving what won them game number two. So they are going to be sticking with that. And, I mean, it could be the same kind of play. Eradicator Hexapod, you know, kind of working off of two Tiberium fields. This map is a little bit weird. You do have the, I guess, disadvantage of it is a FFA-style map. So everyone is split to their own quadrant. This is not a proper teams-style map like Tournament Forest or uh, Tiberium Forest. Whatever it's called. And uh, Forgotten Forest is what it's called. And some of the other 2v2 community-made maps. First Seeker Tank coming on out from space. But it looks like that's just a uh, scouting Seeker Tank, not a... I'm going all in with some kind of a parade push right out of the gate kind of move. That's, um, that's weird to see. <laughs> Having to drop a hand of Nod in your ally's base to stop an attack is not something you see very often. But it's something that Eclipse did indeed do. So Prime White trying to uh, do some sneaky early attacks. He gets shut down by a combo defense from Eclipse and Shock Trepid. Expanding down to the south for space, he chooses not to take the safe expansion back behind their two bases. Prime White, it looks like his MCV is getting caught up in the, uh, not quite in the middle, but in his own main base and uh, going to be delaying his own expansion there. One Harvester going to be going down. The bikes commit to the attack, and the repairs are good enough to keep that Harvester alive. Also, I think those bikes were firing on different targets instead of all focusing down one Harvester. Very unfortunate there for Prime White that he missed that opportunity to take down that Harvester. Defensive bikes coming in for Eclipse to uh, guard that away. And, well, okay, Eclipse off of two refineries. He is fast teching before the expansion. He's also kind of base creeping off of this. So he is cutting things quite slim down to the bone. He is just wanting to get some kind of tech up and running, possibly just into a redeemer. And then that is it for him. Although it could also be some kind of a base push move. Ah, the MCV is on the way and the MCV is not angled to the north. It is instead angled directly for Prime White's base. This could be, no it's not, it's not a obelisk push. This is for something else. Like, I don't know why he got the tech lab that early on. It's not necessarily for anything directly. It is, uh, it is for something eventually, but nothing right now. Nerve Center is up and running for space at his natural expansion. The MCV is almost at the base of Prime White. Prime White is getting a couple of shots on it. Even the militant squad's putting a little bit of DPS out onto the MCV as it's on the move. Rocket squads are here. Watchtower most likely going to be going down and maybe an obelisk as well. We'll have to see if Space chooses to support this attack. No AP ammo on this watchtower. A curious choice, an unupgraded watchtower. And this attack might just be going disastrously as we do have a storm column, as we do have even a Devastator warship directly onto the front lines for Space. He is going to be just busting down this Conyard with the help of those Scorpion tanks in almost no time flat. Goodbye, Conyard. Shock Trap, it's MCV out of the game. Low power mode for Eclipse. And this game-winning Gambit may have gone completely south for Eclipse and Shock Trap. It. Even Eclipse going to be losing Scorpion tanks and possibly Avatars to cheap, low-tech units. Although the, uh, the descents will actually be dealt with by the Shredder turrets. So then the Avatars will be able to deal with the Seeker tanks pretty darn easily after that. 
So it looks like Eclipse will be able to hold the line, but in the north, this attack did not go at all how Shock Trap it was planning. Although at the same time, he's got another MCV out on the map, so he is unfazed by his complete shutdown on the front door of Prime White. And he himself has just gone is going for an expansion. He's like, well, let's try again. And actually, the, the Stealth Tanks get the drop on the Devastator Warships and are going to completely shut down the Devastator Warships after the War Factory goes down. Prime White and Space committing a lot to this attack, but they're starting to get picked apart. Where are the Scorpion tanks? No, the Scorpion, the Stealth tanks, rather, are actually dealing with a flame tank from Prime White that was trying to sneak in the side. And instead, these Scorpion tanks are going for harvesters, but they're getting picked apart by, by Stealth tanks and by Pitbulls, by Watch Towers, and by Rocket Squads. And that, that uh, revenge attack that bounce back just went nowhere and somehow Space and Prime White who were looking to be in a pretty solid position are getting kicked out of their locations. The Avatar follow-up for Eclipse is enough to push back everything that Space had and granted what Space had wasn't very much. Space may have actually split himself a little bit too thin and now they're both going to be expanding backwards potentially. No, he's long distance harvesting from the same field as Prime White and this attack from these Seeker tanks, they're going for the Harvester, they get the kill, but it's going to be at the cost of four Seeker tanks. Four Seeker tanks for one Harvester and when Prime White and Space have as little as they have, I'm not sure that that is a good move. Actually, Eclipse, does he... They better hope that Eclipse doesn't have a tip chemical plant. Uh, he, he has something queued. Oh, because these refineries are quite close to each other. And that would be terrible if they lost both of those refineries in one fell swoop. Prime White also has his tier 3, so he, uh, he doesn't have the cash to go for a catalyst missile at this point. So for now... The refineries of Shock Trep will be established. He made a major misstep with that attack going against Prime White and Space in the north, but honestly, he's bounced back from it. Shock Trepid, he's got his natural expansion up and running, and he is definitely not where he would like to be tech-wise, but he is stabilizing for sure. Command post is up, AP ammo on the way. Space is dropping more cash on these attacks, which this one is going to go nowhere as well. He'll get the drop on some of these riflemen, but ultimately those descents just fell flat on their face. They did nothing. Fortunately for Space, Eclipse hasn't been able to push up north. Eclipse hasn't been able to bust in the front door of Space. But Eclipse is actually going for a double MCV play. He's going to be expanding to the entire southern half of the map. He'll have all three of those Tiberium fields under his control, although this one doesn't count for much. I mean, I guess at this point he could sell off the refinery, get a little bit of cash back, but... A tough spot for space to be in. Sells off the War Factory, gets a Warp Chasm instead, heals up his tripods to try and fight better another day. But it's going to be Eradicator Hexapod versus Engineering uh, Redeemer. And the question always is, in that kind of a situation, who has the better support around their epic unit? Space is going to go for it right now. He can't really push into this base. It's going to be two tripods and three uh, avatars against five avatars, but base defenses as well from Eclipse. And actually, a couple... Oh, no, there's no anti-air here on the front line. Does he have anything queued? I don't think it's an anti-air turret, as these corruptors are going to get overwhelmed by the hammerheads. One goes down as two tripods on the front line get eliminated, and those hammerheads will not be stopped for the current moment. Both of the husks get eliminated and now it's like six avatars versus the four of Prime White. Space drops the plasma missile battery, but it's a little too late. Obelisk's also going to be getting in onto the fight on both sides. The Eradicator Hexpot is here on the front line. Prime White also shows up with a stealth tank to potentially sneak around the side and do some critical damage, but this double expansion from Eclipse is going to favor him the longer that this game goes on. You've got one team which has literally 75% of the Tiberium under their control on the map, and the other team, which is quickly eating up the last 
last of the Tiberium under their control. They cannot win a war of attrition. Space and Prime White have to make something happen right now. Every moment that elapses, they get further behind in the economy game. Space is going to try and make something happen, but with just the Eradicator Hexbot and a couple of Avatars, it's going to be tough to find an angle that's really going to be able to work here. Hammerheads do show up. They're going to get tanked. They're going to get shot down by those stealth tanks. The stealth tanks get off one volley. Uh, I don't know what that avatar was hoping to do. Those two avatars that were way out in front, that weren't trying to hang out and pick stuff off of their opponent, but were out in front in some kind of a bold but rash play. That is just not good news. Prime White and Space, they better have some real EMPs up their sleeve to stop this Redeemer, to stop all of these avatars, this Obelisk and the Sonic Emitter from just breaking down their front door. Juggernauts on the front line in the north. And it's Delta going to be coming in here for Prime White. He's going to be able to get one Harvester for sure, a second Harvester. Not, not so much if that Sonic Emitter gets a actual shot off. The Sonic Emitter does fire kind of in a delayed fashion, as you can probably see from those two shots. And so the stealth tank can be microed around it, but goodbye MCV. The drone ship gets eliminated. Space better like what he's got out on the field because that is going to be it as a war factory goes down on the front line for Eclipse. And this Eradicator Hexpod has to get phased to keep it alive. It's going for the crush, but how much will it really be able to do? I guess one avatar is the answer there. I assume the rest of the stuff is... Uh, well, now it's up to Prime White to pull something out of this as space has been defeated. And I guess they kind of figure with an MCV and with more money under his control, Prime White is the one to try and pull off the 2v1. If he could save this Eradicator Hexbot, that would be a great step in the right direction. Crushing an Avatar and an Engineer on the way out would be fantastic. But that phase is going to wear off relatively soon here. Tier 3 is going down for the Skrin, so that part of the tech tree has been eliminated. And that Eradicator Hexabod barely surviving the onslaught. The phase truly saving it, but no! It goes down as Prime White not able to keep it alive. And now the Warp Chasm going to be going down, and the 2v1 is truly being seen in full effect here as Shock Trepic closes in from the right side. And Eclipse tr closes in from the left side, just stomping their big, high-tech, expensive armies to the front door of Prime White. And things did fall apart for Prime White and for Space. They were doing all right when they held off that attack, but they were never able to establish their own natural expansions. That's what Eclipse and Shock Trepid were both able to do, GG gets called. Game number three goes to Eclipse and Shock Trepid pretty convincingly. But as I said, it all came down to the establishment of those natural expansions. Space and Prime White were just not able to do that at all. And Eclipse and Shock Trepid, it, it's, it didn't feel like they had an easy time doing it, but it, they were able to get it done regardless. They sort of shouldered it in and just made it happen. Prime White was able to expand backwards to the safe expansion, which is great for a minute, but as we saw, that meant that Eclipse and Shock Trep were able to control 80% of the Tiberium on the map, something like that. Just all of those fields under their control, and they just absolutely were able to get out of control. And that was a very convincing victory for Eclipse and Shock Trumpet, but they are not out of the woods yet. Space and Prime White have some fight left in them, so let's see what happens in game number four. Which takes us to the map Arizona Sunshine. For game number four, on the left side, as the green nod, this is Eclipse. And as the yellow GDI, this is is Shock Trepid. They are sticking with their chosen factions all the way through, and can you blame them? They've been showing some great games with that combo. In the north, as the red Skren, this is space. And as the purple nod, this is prime white. I don't know if game number one was a bit of a fluke because Space has chosen to play Skrin every game besides that. 
And I don't know if game number one, he was, you know, if Space might typically be a, you know, Scrin slash Scrin sub faction player. And game one, he was like, hey, I'm going to play GDI because GDI is strong. But uh, then he decided to go back to Scrin where he's a little bit more comfortable, perhaps, for the rest of the games. But we'll have to see if he continues to choose Scrin or if, uh, or if he changes things up in the future. So far, things are looking pretty standard from everyone. It's game number four. It is match point for our team in the south. They're going to be looking to seal things up. Nice spread on those refineries from everyone. No one wants to get one-clicked by, uh, by a fast tech. Scouting buggy comes through for Eclipse. Whoever wins this series is going to be man, those buzzer, those buzzers uh, having a tough time with these with these riflemen. Whoever wins this series is going to be going up against Drive and Futurama, which is not going to be an easy match. It is going to be difficult to get into the finals against Drive and Futurama here on the north side of the bracket. Eclipse and Shock Trepet primed to do that. Space and Prime White ready to push them back. Both teams pretty well mirroring each other in general strategy, but then also their expansion timings and everything else. Both teams getting their natural expansions up and running. I guess uh, Space and Prime White are a little bit slower in that way. But uh, Space choosing to move his MCV himself instead of just going off of the build radius of Prime White. A couple of buggies heading around the map. A couple of Seeker tanks as well. Space could just be looking to guard this Blue Tiberium. I don't think anyone has stolen the Blue Tiberium yet. Although maybe they were sneaky. They got like half a load of Tiberium and then they escaped away with it. Secret Tank's going to be trading against these pit bulls, and lucky for space. Check that out. Those buzzers in that building actually absorbing a couple of shots from those pit bulls. So those pit bulls would have gotten the kill on that Secret Tank much sooner if they hadn't been firing at that garrisonable structure. Harvesters from Shock Trepet going back to work. And once again, Eclipse with just this single scouting buggy running around the map trying to cause some problems but not necessarily doing very much just keeping an eye on everything the secret tanks from space this is a nice little trade here gobbling up as many pit bulls as he can if the gdi player is wanting to go for mass pit bulls then cutting down pit bulls early makes dealing with those uh what is going on here why is this harvester here eclipse accidentally i think sending a harvester way out of its way Either that or it was originally going to be going for the Blue Tiberium and it kind of got routed in a weird way trying to avoid this bike buggy little attack group. Eclipse with a couple of Scorpions is going to be able to push that bike buggy away. Down one Harvester is going to be a bit unfortunate for Eclipse, although he's already got three Harvesters on his natural expansion running, uh, running quite well. Seeker Tanks are going to... Well, actually, no, never mind. I was going to say they're going to protect that Harvester, but honestly, the Harvester doesn't need any protecting with the phase going to be uh, allowing it to harvest this Blue Tiberium quite nicely. Rocket squads are going to be dealt with by the Buzzer Swarm that was just called in, and the Seeker Tanks will deal with the Pit Bulls quite nicely. Um, at the same time, Shock Trepet has finally gotten up quite a few refineries, quite a few harvesters, and he's kind of been slowly building this. He's the one who moved his MCV, so his first refinery on the expansion was a little bit delayed, but now he is well set up. Lots of harvesters, you know, three in the north, four in the south, five in the south even. He's got lots of harvesters set up. He's got his command post online. He is going for that AP ammo. And then, of course, for Tier 3 most likely, and maybe even a Marv after that. But at any rate, Shock Trepet is well set up for this game. He has uh, set himself up quite nicely. Eclipse, on the other hand, maybe a little bit uh, less robust in that way, but he's up to Tier 3. He's got those dozer blades on the scorpions. Laser capacitors could be the follow-up for that. And this harvester from space, well, one of them was phased. The second one was not. 
And a little bit of a mistake there from Space. Looks like those holograms expired just as they were setting up on that scouting infantry squad. So the hologram expired at just the right time from the Eclipse Shock Trepid perspective. Rocket Squad's coming in here. They get a kill on one Seeker tank, but both teams just looking to power up to that late game. They've got their kind of mid-game economy rolling. They've been trading with some low-tech fighting groups here and there. But honestly, oh no, this Scorpion tank army is going to set upon this Conyard immediately, and this is more than enough Scorpions to burn down one Obelisk as uh, even some support powers getting called in here. Possibly Tip Vapor Bomb being utilized on top of this Conyard to try and finish it off. Avatar and Eradicator Hexapod going to be coming in here. And the Conyard down, now down to one-third health as the Eradicator Hexapod is going to get this group of Scorpion tanks in the north. This is going to be a costly attack any way you cut it. But at this point, they're just going to commit. They're going to try and get the kill, and they won't! The Conyard survives! Shock Trepic calls in an Orca Strike, but that is going to be pretty much it for him. I don't, I don't know. I, uh, Tib Chemical Plant fired off a Catalyst Missile somewhere, but there is going to be the Engineer moments before the Conyard would have gone down. And a Tip Catalyst Missile uh, l eliminated one of those refineries there for Shock Trepid. So it's unfortunate for him there. But he's got the majority of that field already on lock. This refinery up here has a lot more Tiberium that's close to it. So that's not going to be the worst thing for Shock Trepid. He's going to be okay. He's got pretty good economy rolling. Re uh, t Redeemer Engineering Facility now online. Wormhole going to be exiting somewhere on the map. I'm not exactly sure where. Way up here in the north to push back this railgun predator tank army from Shock Trepid. And this is a lot of scrin to hold off that force. Although at the same time, these hammerheads, they're not actually loaded up with anything necessarily. Yeah, it looks like they may all be empty there. Which, by the way, if you've got some extra rifleman squads, even rifleman squads with that AP ammo inside of those hammerheads just gives you that extra bit of DPS, that extra ability to clean up infantry or base defenses or whatever that much more quickly. And these guys are ready to rock them, sock them with these giant late game armies. Epic units are out on the field. Two harvesters head to the middle of the map to steal this Tiberium. And Prime White just barely isn't going to see that. So for now, those harvesters will be able to continue harvesting away. Beacons getting dropped pretty much everywhere. I think Space or Prime White, someone is saying, hey, drop a refinery here. There's lots of Tiberium to be had. Prime White barely escaping with his MCV from that situation earlier. And double zone trooper, double engineer inside of this Marv. A classic setup as there's even a pack here on the front line. Obelisk as well. Ooh, Shock Trepid. He's got this army in the north. As everything on the right side moves down to the south, you have to ask yourself the question, do I push in to the unprotected base of my opponent? Or do I pull down south to try and defend against this gigantic army that is crushing down the front door? Nice force fire on the ground by Prime White to avoid that Rage Gen from firing off and doing massive damage. And what is this? A couple of Pitbulls fire off. A Catalyst missile going to be crashing down to Space's expansion refinery here at the third base. So Space loses that refinery right out of the gate. And it looks like a Photon Cannon and a Shredder Turret both going to be going down to deal with those, uh, to deal with those Pitbulls. Nuclear Missile coming down for Eclipse. We didn't get to see the nuke firing off in game number one. Perhaps we will see it here in game number four. We gotta see more nukes in these games. It's always great to see the super weapons actually be utilized. Disruption Tower is here. Shockwave artillery firing off somewhere, and it's going to be the stasis to lock down that Redeemer. At the same time, the tip vapor bomb or whatever that was gets annihilated before it actually gets to the front line. Zone Trooper Drop Pod gets brought in as well just to support this army, but the EMP is good enough on top of this Redeemer. A great catch here by Space as all of his stuff comes back online from the EMP, and he gets his own Redeemer kill. Very nicely done there, but the army in the north is about to tear through Space's base, and Space 
space may not have much infrastructure left over after this. Railgun Predators are going to absolutely shred this base as Shock Trepid adds on an Ion Cannon and the game of delay becomes very, very apparent for our team on the left side. The longer this game goes on, the better chance they'll have of just winning the War of Attrition with super weapons. Firehawk's going to be able to come in here to try and clean up these Venoms, which are trying to clean up the Rocket Squads on the ground. Predator Tanks backing up from the front line. The Eradicator Hexapod has been able to scare away that army, but this has caused a major disruption for Prime White and for Space. They have been completely distracted from the attack that they were poised and ready to pull off in the southern part of the map. They have pulled their entire army back. They have gone for the defense against these Railgun Preds, which, you know, is warranted, but at the same time is a total disruption and buys so much time for Eclipse and Shock Trepid. Once again, Shock Trepid is just going to be cruising around someone's base with a couple of Predator tanks, although it's not going to work out quite as well for him in this case. Although, actually, no, that might have been... Uh that might have been someone in the first semifinal or first quarterfinal that I'm thinking of, and not actually this this game. It was definitely a yellow GDI player. Was that quarterfinal one? I think it actually was. Uh, what is the Spectre doing? The Spectre is going for a for a sneaky play. This is Prime White Spectre, and it's for some reason it's in the back of the base of Eclipse and Shock Trap. And I mean, like Spectres are good, but but they're not that good. They are, uh, he's going for a scout. I'm not, I don't know what he's doing. He's going for a Sunday drive or something. He's just, he's just off on his own. I think he got like accidentally routed and now Prime White is just like, I don't, I don't know what to do with this, uh, with this Spectre. The power plant does survive the orchestra, this little cluster of power plants. What is, is this single militant squad really worth firing that Spectre artillery at it? I guess so. Corruptors are here to try and keep this Eradicator Hexpot alive, but this is not nearly enough for Corruptors, and they're going to actually have to whisk away that Eradicator Hexpot as space after taking a beating from those from those Railgun Preds. Actually, he's going to be getting caught. Prime White gets caught in the middle of the map. Tip Vane detonation fires off, and Shockwave Artillery may be locking down the Redeemer, and yes, the Redeemer gets caught by the EMP. The phase is going to be what saves that Redeemer space once again, saving a unit in the middle of the map. Those epic units just barely surviving. Shock Trepid and Clips feeling like they had him dead to rights, but not quite. They might be able to get the MCV and the rest of this base as the Eradicator Hexpot is trying to stand against the Mammoth Tanks in the north. The MCV will fall in the south. Overwhelming firepower. Have your phase have your surviving epic units. They won't have much left to run home to. Three avatars step forward, but they're going to get crushed by the avatars and the juggernauts of Eclipse and Shock Trepid as the Marv cycles down to the south. And the Spectre Artillery get off some fantastic shots against the Juggernauts of Shock Trep. And eventually, the Juggernauts will fall as three, four, or five of them going down in just a moment or two. The Rage Gen firing off and desperately trying to make a uh, trying to spin straw into gold. Prime White and Space, with this entire army bearing down upon them, are desperate to try and find an angle to make this defense work. Space and Prime White now going to have the Rage Gen set upon them, almost killing off this Redeemer in the north as he does manage to survive. And the Eradicator Hexpot also survives. The Firehawks coming through, blasting down one of the packs. The other one survives for the current moment, but Shock Trepid will not be stopped. His powerhouse late game GDI army continues to crush forward with the Avatars and the Redeemers of Eclipse. And there is not much to stop this much firepower like the stuff from prime white and space is good but it's not nearly enough numbers it's not nearly as robust as the army that eclipse and shock trepid have and with one point advantage in this game in this best of five they're looking to close things out and head into the semi finals it is going to have to be some kind of a incredible comeback for Space and Prime White to stick around in this game. One minute on the clock for that nuke until unholy hellfire rains down upon Space.
and that will do it. Prime White leaving the game moments ago, and Space finishing out the game in that series. Arizona Sunshine providing some pretty fantastic action, but ultimately Shock Trepid and Eclipse being able to power up much more quickly and much more confidently than Space and Prime White, who were floundering a little bit there and getting picked apart. They never quite got their feet under them the way they would like in that game number four. And as a result, Space and Prime White are out of the tournament eclipse and Shock Trepid continue on into the semifinals. But we have two more quarterfinals to get through and to see who the other half of the semifinals will be. So let's jump into game number one, which takes us back to Hurricane Lands for game number one of quarterfinal C. Our northern team kicking it off with green GDI. This is Aggressive Panda. And their teammate as the purple nod. This is One Vision. Now moving on to the south side of Hurricane, we have as the blue screen. This is Haru Specs. And rounding it out as the orange GDI. This is green zero. Once again, a delightful best of five on our hands. We're kicking it off with Hurricane Lands. Hurricane Lands and Forgotten Force definitely been two of the favorites for quite a while in uh, 2v2s, especially community-made maps. They work quite, they work quite well, and uh, you know, Forgotten Force kind of mimics. Tiberium Rift, or Tournament Rift, rather, and I don't know, this one doesn't really feel like any of the other ones, I guess. A lot of the uh, community maps do this sort of north-south split like this, but uh, this one, I don't know, it just plays out maybe a little bit different. It feels a little bit different. So far, things are looking pretty straightforward, pretty standard from these guys. Coming into it, it's hard to ignore. Green Zero making the finals of the 1v1 tournament. He and Haru Specs, you know, we've definitely seen some great games from them in the past in the 1v1 circuit. And I know also Green Zero in the past has developed some specific 2v2 strategies, or at least some unit comps and some things that they think people won't uh, see coming. However, I don't know if he's practiced any of those things with Haru Specs, so could be entirely just I play GDI you play Nod kind of thing or rather Scrim or it could be that they're gonna come up with some real combos disintegrators and APCs or something like that go for some kind of a I wouldn't say rush in this case because it's uh, played out very slowly in the beginning but they could be going for something specific But yeah, other than that, everything is looking about as normal as it could be. Aggressive Panda and One Vision. I feel like I've really only seen these guys in a team game uh, context. So they definitely have done well in team games, but I don't know the last time I saw them in a series. Panda beaconing the barracks of Green Zero. He's like, hey, that seems suspicious. Why, why would you need a barracks at this point? And of course, it's for rocket squads inside of the APCs. He's going to go for a little bit of Harvester harassing. A couple of Rocket Squads inside of these APCs. They're not going to try and close the distance at first, at least. They might be going to just mine the Tiberium Field and do damage that way, not necessarily about uh, doing the direct damage with the units inside of them. First Predator's Tank is going to cycle around to the other side of the War Factory and escape for now as the Seeker Tanks come in for Haru Specs. He's going to be able to potentially jump on one of these Harvesters. For now, the Laser Turrets and the Predator Tanks are doing a pretty good job of defending. Repair Drone's going to be coming down as low power mode, going to be taking those Laser Turrets offline for just a moment. And now the Seeker Tanks are all pulling back. This attack just disappeared in a matter of moments, you know, after dropping both support powers. They just completely disappeared. The Harvesters have survived well, and that attack uh, sort of just went nowhere. It looked like it was going to be able to be sustained for, for a little while longer, but it just disappeared and fell apart in an instant. And now I wonder if the counterattack will have an opportunity to do some damage. With the, with the awkwardness of how that attack begun and was disbanded, 
there might be an opportunity for Panda and One Vision to join together forces and hit either Green Zero or Haru Specs. Although if they uh, if they wait too much longer, then they may not have much of an advantage at all. A couple of Seeker tanks over here on the right side of the map. Scorpion tanks going to be circling in for One Vision. And right now, Panda may have to deal with Green Zero while Haru Specs deals with One Vision. Kind of a split force situation. Panda going to be joining up with One Vision on the right side of this Tiberium field, but is it going to be enough? One Vision going for the refinery. Panda continuing to cycle down to the south side of this field, not directly engaging Green Zero. Instead, going to be going for the joint force. They're going to be targeting down these refineries, shutting down the infrastructure rather than going for the army, making more of the long play rather than trying to win the game right now. Although certainly if they turn all of their guns on these tanks, this is not that many Predator tanks, it's not that many APCs. The dev tanks would present a bit of a problem, but up close and personal, you can deal with the dev tanks without too much trouble. It looks like infantry running through Tiberium in the north. Beacons going down as a couple of flame tanks do get spotted, I think. Although these are uh, One Vision's flame tanks, so I'm not sure what the, uh, what the problem is. It looked like Panda was the one. Oh, I know. I guess Haru Specs is the one who uh, who beaconed there. So Haru Specs sees the flame tanks. He was heading there with the dev tanks, and then he decides to hold off for the current moment. For now, it looks like the riflemen are going to be that early warning system. As Panda and One Vision joined forces, now Green Zero and Haru Specs are going to be joining forces. Dev tanks are going to be able to put out some good DPS, but the Predator tanks are somewhat being ignored now, getting to do some free DPSs. No from the North, Panda collapses in, and the numbers are again overwhelming as they were moments ago, but now the attack is actually encompassing, and that's just three Dev tanks, which as soon as the guns turn on them will fall to pieces. Way too many tanks here. A couple of flames going to be coming in as well. Haru Specs now doesn't have anything to stop the flamers. And it looks like Green Zero doesn't have much in the way of reinforcement. And this is not the sort of game I was expecting to see. Green Zero and Haru Specs may still be able to pull something out here. But I think it'll be much more on the Green Zero side than on the Haru Specs side. He's getting some nice damage done with these dev tanks. Dev tanks do put out a good amount of DPS with Seekers and Gunwalkers to kind of add to it. It can wear down an army, but this entire expansion has been shut down. Even the power plant goes down as another beacon gets dropped. And Green Zero, that's why he has not been engaging with this army. He has been getting up to Sonic Emitters. He has been getting up to Juggernauts. And, uh, oh, those are actually going to be scouting harvesters. So there is the one click. There is the refinery falling into the ground. And goodbye, economy. Dev tanks getting caught. Going to be trading against pit bulls and railgun predators. Never something you want to have happen is just with one or two dev tanks getting caught out in the open. And once again, Haru Specs under threat as his infrastructure is just going to fall apart. It looks like Panda is not even interested in engaging the army. He just wants to shut down the war factory. No more production. Haru Specs literally has nothing but the units that are out on the map. And Haru Specs has been defeated. Everything gets handed over to Green Zero. And maybe he will be able to make use of this Skrin infrastructure Going to be dropping a Sonic emitter there as well, just to hold off the defense. And the 1v2 begins. It is never an easy fight to go up against two players like this. They've got twice as many, you know, places that they can pay attention to than you. But Green Zero may be able to pull something off here. He's got a little strike force in the south. Haru Specs may have overextended himself, committing so much to the attack to try and shut down or excuse me, One Vision may have committed so much to the attack to try and shut down Haru Specs that he may be left a little bit vulnerable. Uh, One Vision also sending in a tank there. Maybe a little bit of a pathing problem as it does just go in there for no particularly good reason. One Avatar here in the south, but these dev tanks could jump on the MCV if they notice it and do some pretty critical damage. They're instead going to be going for the Harvesters, the much more sensible target in a lot of ways. One Harvester down, the other Harvester is going to be getting targeted and eliminated, but this Avatar army, three Avatars rather, once they get down here, they will be able to shred those tanks. Predators in the north as Green Zero drops a Lightning Spike, has a delay tactic trying to buy himself some more time. One Vision with two more Flame Tanks heading along the southern part of the map, and two Vertigos just to help deal with this army. Vertigo is very good at clearing out units, especially units that tend to clump. 
You can just do absolutely massive damage. And Green Zero, this is his big attempt. He's got a big one-two punch potentially coming towards Panda. Panda, oh, this is going to be hard for Green Zero to break. Those Juggernauts are good, but Vertigos and Juggernauts are so much better. And either repeat bombing runs against the Marv or just what you see how, uh, One Vision doing right there, bombing out the Juggernauts as they're out of range of the other Juggernauts is a great way to go. Obelisk's going to be potentially getting some shots off there. Is actually going to be completely eliminating. Huh. He just he just got that uh that tip chemical plant. I'm not exactly sure what all he did to uh, to clean that up, but Green Zero just cleaned up that tip chemical plant. Shockwave artillery completely destroys the Marv, and Green Zero going to be dropping Zocom or Zone Troopers directly on top of this army. He was going to try and jump on these Juggernauts, which would have been massive damage. His return Shockwave artillery getting some good hits off, but it wasn't enough. The Zone Troopers got eliminated, and Panda jumping on the opportunity will be able to uh, will be able to deal with that support power but also this army reinforcements getting called in green zero bringing out everything he can another juggernaut falls as the juggernauts of aggressive panda are actually hitting some pretty good shots that apc going to be getting pushed away one vision with his avatars and his stealth tanks in the south side going to be getting pushed away by zone troopers and jugs and i mean zone troopers do pretty good damage versus avatars when they're in this good of numbers Actually, I may be able to clean up this avatar as it's trying to walk away. Unfortunately, Green Zero may not have a lot of uh, engineers, may not have any engineers packed along for the ride. I guess he could airdrop them over there. But Green Zero somehow still finding little groups of units to sneak into the back of this base. I'm legitimately not sure how he got these units back there. But uh, the Lightning Spike and the Gunwalkers will be dealt with via Vertigo Bombers as the Zone Troopers jump out of that field. And Aggressive Panda going to be dropping the Watchtowers and repositioning his Juggernauts. Did he ever... I think his Marv went down. I actually don't remember if he built one. But Green Zero's Marv, I don't think, has been rebuilt at this point. Now it looks like he got rid of the Reclamator Hub. Green Zero, having cycled completely out of the southern half of the map, is just existing on this one little base in the north. It doesn't have a ton of Tiberium left. Sniper teams included in the mix by Aggressive Panda. Great use of the Buzzer Swarm support power, but it was a little too close to the support units for those snipers. So the snipers are just slowly but surely trying to pick off the uh, slowly but surely trying to pick off those zone raiders or zone troopers rather, as he's not playing Zocom. Supersonic airstrike comes in. I couldn't tell if it was a whiff or not. A couple of zone troopers on the north side, a couple of juggernauts. Green Zero is doing what he can to try and stay active and just clean and create problems more. Not He can't really clean anything up, but he's trying to create problems for his opponent. A couple of stealth tanks sneaking in the back around the side. One vision finding the opening, finding the opportunity, and even going to be getting the magic, magic splash damage on top of those harvesters and one more harvester will go down two more harvesters go down those zone troopers finally cleaning up those stealth tanks but this is so many juggernauts here for aggressive panda green zero has been defeated game number one i will admit i did not expect it aggressive panda and one vision to take that so convincingly i expected uh green zero in all respects to be much more dominant in that game but the fact that they were going toe to toe with One Vision and Panda, and then One Vision and Panda turned it around and brought the victory is, uh, is pretty surprising to me. But we'll have to see if the trend continues or if that was just a game one powerhouse punch. Let's see what happens in game number two, which takes us to Asteroid Outpost. Not a map that I think I've ever seen, although I'm guessing based on the aesthetic that it is very similar to Tournament Undergrounds. I guess we will see exactly how it plays out. But in the northern position, as the blue screen, this is Haru Specs. And then spawning on the other side of these fields, as the orange GDI, this is Green Zero. Boy, this spawning position is kind of like roped in. You got a, a space, you got a 
Rocket over here. You got Craters over here. That's kind of like a tight spot for an MCV. Anyways, on the south side of the map, our other team currently up 1-0 in this best of five as the green GDI. This is Aggressive Panda. And on the other side of the field, also in the tight spot, this is the purple nod is One Vision. Okay, so those are not actually fields in the kind of uh, northwest and southeast corners. I guess maybe some of this might be technically traversable ground, but I don't think it's designed to be. So you start on a kind of double Tiberium field, but it's got this split. So one player is on the left and one player is on the right. And then you've got kind of like a shared expansion to the north or south of you. But that's some good distance between them. Again, I've never seen a game on this map, so I'm excited to see how it plays out. The aesthetic reminds me of Tournament Underground, but the layout does not at all remind me of Tournament Underground. I guess it's all sort of one level, but uh, but you've got that sort of underground area, and then much more broken up than Tournament Galaxy or that space map, which is very like super duper flat and has very little uh, very little to it other than flatness. MCV on the move for Green Zero. Panda does see it, takes a couple of shots there. Isn't too worried about doing too much more than that. Green Zero deploying directly in the middle of the two fields, which is what you would expect, kind of the shared expansion thing. Green Zero going for the scout on the south side of the map. We'll have to see if anyone goes for the EMP control centers. No big takers on the tip spikes in the middle of the map. They're just waiting to be captured at this point. Last game felt very, let's just play our sort of 1v1 styles, and then we'll just sort of support each other for both teams. Maybe a little more... Uh, cooperation between Panda and One Vision. A little more coordination of when and where to strike. But no real like crazy builds or nothing real specific like we saw in semifinal A with Drive and Futurama pulling out some pretty specific stuff for the maps and some pretty specific builds to, uh, to work together. Even if they didn't always perfectly work out like they're in game number three against that Reckoner Rush. Pitbulls on the north side for Aggressive Panda. Green Zero able to steal a full load of Blue Tiberium. Able to get that away. Secret Tank in the north from Haru Specs. Going to be kind of engaging with, uh, with Panda there. Couple more Seekers coming out. All right, One Vision is moving in. We'll see if he and Aggressive Panda really want to keep up this attack. Aggressive Panda teching into Tier 2, but not necessarily much beyond that. His MCV is still sitting back at home. Looks like he could be going Tier 3. Green Zero bringing his own Pit Bulls for defense against the Pit Bulls of Panda. One Vision going to be skating in here with a couple of bikes, a couple of Scorps. A lot of saber, saber rattling in this game. Scouting each other out, trying to see if there are any obvious weak points or opportunities. And the short answer is there aren't really. Something just deployed out for Aggressive Panda. Tier 3 way over there. Go ahead, uh, goes ahead and fences it off. Harvesters from Aggressive Panda going to be getting hunted by these pit bulls. This is the sort of thing Green Zero was hoping for with these pit bulls just sort of sharking around the map. He's going to get the kill on one Harvester nice and easy there. Looks like upgrades coming in for these Gunwalkers and these Seekers, at least attenuated force fields. We'll have to see if Shard Launchers also gets, gets purchased. Dev Tanks and Pit Bulls. Pretty good numbers coming out for Haru Specs and Green Zero. Going to be using up a bit of his Tiberium infusion to kill off that infantry, the infantry inside of that building. 
Might wish he had that Tib infusion once it actually comes time to battle. Pitbull coming through the middle of the map, and this is a lot of Scorpions potentially catching out these Pitbulls. Looks like One Vision was the one to grab those Tib spikes in the middle of the map. Not sure if he was the first one, but he was the one that controls them now. And Pitbulls for Green Zero managing to sneak around the side. This is not like the longest term Harvester hit, but hey, if he can get three Harvester kills here, that will be fantastic. Maybe even pick up a Stealth Tank as well as he has enough he has enough Pitbulls to get the kill pretty easily there. Goes for the Harvester, but Storm Riders are now out for Haru Specs. And the continuation of this, you know, light engagement... You can go into those Storm Riders, and it is potentially a surprise. We'll have to see Green Zero, Hammerheads, and Pitbulls. It's the Twin Frog of Kane's Wrath. Stealth Tanks and Scorpions trying to hold off the Storm Riders and the Dev Tanks. APC's even getting in on the action. These Dev Tanks able to pull out a couple of shots, but really the Dev Tanks are just dying to the GDI forces. And now with the Juggernauts here, this is going to be even harder for them to escape. They're going to be able to pick up one or two more APC kills. And the uh, Pitbulls joining together Green Zero with a... No, actually not Green Zero with the Firehawks, but rather Aggressive Panda with the Firehawks trying to clear the skies. Panda has kind of recovered this field here. And actually, Panda going to be potentially losing his MCB as the Storm Riders come back through. Some Sam Sites going down, but this is a lot of hammerheads to easily defeat the Sam Site turrets. And goodbye, MCV. Green Zero pretty solidly shutting down Aggressive Panda. And definitely the Storm Riders being a big help in this case as well. Aggressive Panda coming back through with the Firehawks, able to cut down a couple more of those hammerheads. And oh! Three more Hammerheads going down to the Stealth Tanks as the Dev Tanks continue to distract the Juggernauts by eating their shells directly in the face. The Stealth Tanks and the uh, Sam Sites continuing to tear down these Storm Riders as the last one goes down. Haru Specs overstaying his welcome there and losing every single Storm Rider. Green Zero continuing to expand down to the south, but now One Vision showing up with a good amount of Scorpion tanks. It's going to be up against Predators and Tripods as well, and the Tripods will stomp all over this army. Goodbye, Scorpion tanks. Aggressive Panda pulling back through this area, trying to guard, I'm guessing, with the Firehawks in the anti-air mode. Not so much looking to uh, drop bombs on units. Which, I mean, can work, but it's not particularly effective. Triple Stealth Tank backstab coming down as a Storm Column going to be going for the kill on these Stealth Tanks. One might be able to escape, just barely gets away from the Predator Tanks. As a Barracks gets dropped down, another Hammerhead going for a bit of an attack here. Howard Specs going to be dropping a beacon, I think, as he sees this Avatar army closing in on his forces. His Tier 3 is under threat. One Vision could get a pretty good shot off on this drone platform, and if he tries to leave, then uh, that could be really devastating depending on when the avatars actually fire. Looks like a slingshot going down there in the south. This one stealth tank that managed, to, that managed to sneak away, still doing bits of damage here and there, going to be able to pick up one more harvester kill before eventually, actually one pit bull won't be enough to kill off a uh, stealth tank, although it may be able to uh, scare it away for the current moment. A couple of Scorpion tanks getting cleaned up potentially by those Avatars. The Avatars, or the uh, uh, Tripods, excuse me, continue to move north. More Pit Bulls going to be hunting down this Stealth Tank. The Stealth Tank pulls into the corner trying to avoid those Pit Bulls and gets another Pit Bull for its trouble. This one Scorpion tank with hardly any health at all somehow still managing to do some damage to those Harvesters. Avatar is going to be showing up, but now there's tripods, Devastator Warships even. Not that the Devastator Warship is going to be doing that much, but it's a little bit of DPS out there. Stasis locks down every tripod except two. This guy kind of caught on the edge. I'm not actually sure. I guess it counts as he's stasis, even though he doesn't look like he's stasis, but he's not firing at everything, at anything. So I imagine that uh, does indeed count. 
One Vision moving his MCB forward a little bit here. That might be a bit of a mistake. Rifleman going to be engaging, but Aggressive Panda showing up with a lot of Juggernauts in the north. And now all the Avatars are going to be able to melt through the tripods as even the Sam Sites getting some good shots off on these Devastator warships. Sonic Emitter goes down, but Sonic Emitter gets eliminated. And Railgun's Preds are going to support this Avatar army in blasting through Haruspec's base. And Haruspec just, ju just doesn't have much of a ground army here. Green Zero doesn't have much in the way of reinforcements. One hammerhead here, but this is so much firepower. At the same time, Green Zero is going to be cycling through the new base of Panda, crushing the MCV once again for the second time in this game as Harvester's taking a bit of damage there from Rifleman. But once again, Haru Specs just getting the full firepower of the double team on from the left side of the map, just getting targeted down there. Targeted down there. Obelisk gets placed down as a couple of Juggernauts going to be taking some shots and the Avatar as well going to be trying to scare away these Predator tanks. Harvesters and Refineries getting eliminated or sold off as Green Zero's original main base, not that there's much there, is under threat. Two Gravity Stabilizers potentially going to be going down as returning from a bombing run. Those, ha those Firehawks looking for some place to land. Predator tanks continuing to be eliminated. They almost get the Tech Lab. They barely get the kill on the Tech Lab. But what did it cost Green Zero? Can he hold off the entirety of this army with just a Marv? He did some nice damage on the other side of the map, and that was really the only play that was available to him to make. But now he, uh, he's, I mean, this is just... It's just too many lasers at the end of the day. It's just way too much stuff. Haru Specs has been defeated. Green Zero is uh, once again, I mean, the, the 2v1 is possible, but wow, it would be crazy difficult to pull off a 2v1 from this position against all of the stuff that these guys have. Firehawks falling out of the sky as another MCV, the third one, gets produced by Panda. Maybe he'll be able to keep this one safe from Green Zero as One Vision and Panda march to the south looking to cut off the last remaining base of Green Zero. I say that, but he's actually got a couple of outposts in the north still doing something. Not, not really enough to make a comeback off of, but he's still trying to do something. Juggernaut's getting shut down. And, uh, well, Green Zero finally clears the skies, his Firehawks being used for something as his MCV gets destroyed and his last Juggernaut falls. Green Zero has been defeated. That one feeling much more like Green Zero and Horror Specs were in control for the first part of the game, but Panda and One Vision just taking it back with confidence, slapping down Green Zero and Haru Specs in the second part of the game when it felt like... Uh, the team on the right side had a bit of an advantage heading into the mid game. And indeed, they were ahead on economy, both of them. But Panda and One Vision, I guess just the efficiency or something, maybe the faster juggernauts or the more juggernaut numbers. I'm not sure what it was exactly, but they were able to totally turn that around. Maybe the big aircraft commitment not quite working out the way One Vision or the way Haru Specs and Green Zero wanted. They got the kill on that MCV. They did some damage with the Hammerheads and the Storm Riders, but they weren't able to close it out. And in the end, Panda and One Vision go up 2-0 in this series. So, let's see. I mean, Green Zero and Haru Specs are up against the fence here. They need to start putting some points on the board, and that starts with game number three. Which takes us back to Unsound Investment. One of the few official 2v2 maps that, uh, or four player maps, that seems to get some love in the north as the blue screen. This is Haru Specs. And on the other side of the ridge as the orange GDI, this is Green Zero. Meanwhile, our team in the south as the green, as the GDI, this is Panda. Aggressive Panda, and on the other side of the ridge, as the purple nod, this is One Vision. One Vision and Aggressive Panda, again, seen them perform well in team games in the past, but it feels like they are on another level from what I've seen in the past. They are just performing so, so well in this series. Honestly, looking prime to take it in a 3-0 sweep, but 
It would be, it like, looking at this on, in game number one, it would be like, oh, I would be surprised if this was a 3-0 either way. But uh, maybe like a 3-1, Green Zero and Haru specs favored. But in this case, the only way for them to do that is the reverse all kill to, uh, to just pull off a 3-0 from this position, which doesn't seem likely. I mean, unless Green Zero and Haru specs have something pretty specific planned, it's... I don't see how they could win three games in a row with how the first two games went. I just... I mean, the series isn't over, but it feels like we're going to be seeing Panda and One Vision in the semifinals, which they have been playing so well today that it is going to be an entertaining series no matter who ends up on the other side of that semifinals from them. Our respects and Green Zero. Honestly, at this point, if they made it into the semifinals, that would almost be more entertaining because they would have to pull off a 3-0 from this position. And if they're in that kind of shape to do that, then they might just be able to crush the whole thing. I guess it's good options whichever way you slice it. So unlike the last time we saw this map in that first semifinal, it does not appear that we have any particular strategies coming to the forefront. There's no Reckoner Rush, there's no Airfield Rush, there's no uh, MCV cell deploy buildings in your, in your allies' base kind of thing going on. I mean, it's a short walk to your expansion, and there's not a lot of Tiberium on this map, so you might as well get it out early. I guess that is an early airfield from Green Zero, but it's not like, oh, actually, he sells off the command post, so that is actually kind of surprising. Uh, number one, not going for A, uh, AA, not going for AP ammo, I guess APA, but uh, that's pretty surprising. It does get spotted pretty much immediately. One Vision says, hey, what the heck is this? Why does he have an airfield with two orcas, but an expansion MCV position? You better prepare for some anti-air, or you better prepare with some anti-air. Pitbulls and Orca is going to be coming in, and this is maybe not quite ready, not quite prepared for well by Aggressive Panda. Rocket Squad is going to be getting dropped down, one Harvester going down, and honestly, that might be the most of the damage. We'll have to see how the rest of the Harvesters get juked around. Uh, I guess they're not. I guess they thought the, the Orcas were only going to hit that one area, but the rest of these Harvesters are just sitting right here. They didn't get pulled at all. They, uh, they're, just, they're just here. So the Orcas are going to cycle around to the north, chasing the Harvesters and flying directly over the Rocket Squads on their way home. The Orcas do go down, but the Harvesters also getting eliminated. Panda down to just two Harvesters. He's got more refineries than he's got Harvesters at this point. One of them on half health, and Green Zero is back up to three Orcas because he's got this uh, fairly focused unit composition at this point. Haru Specs, on the other hand, going to be expanding out to this field, and, uh, well... He's got a couple of descents, but is he keeping this portal around because he forgot to sell it off, or is he keeping the portal around because he's going to go mass descents or something like that? Orca's going to be trading out with these pit bulls against the forces of One Vision, as One Vision trying to strike back on behalf of Panda and, like, get some kind of revenge, but honestly, he just doesn't have very much to really do there. I mean, it's it's a lightning spike, a, uh, a photon cannon as well, and then orcas with repairs right there. So it's going to be hard to break that base with just, you know, cheap, low armor units like bikes and buggies. Blue Tiberium getting stolen there by Haru Specs. He's going to be able to pull away with that Blue Tiberium. And honestly, I know actually Green Zero is doing the exact same thing. A little bit of a Titan on the ground there. Look at that Titan just hanging out. Too bad it's not a neutral unit that you could uh, capture with the rifle. <laughs> I don't know that that would necessarily make... Yeah, actually, that would be good for one competitive map to have a couple of units that you could just grab. Just like oddball units. A, uh, an, a prototype Titan or something. Almost like having mutant hovels on the map. It's like, in a competitive game, almost no one ever, ever gets them. But it's fun to have them there. It's fun for the option to exist. Orchestra going to be coming in directly on top of that refinery, hoping for the Harvester to be there, but it looks like it won't be. And Green Zero going to be able to pick off a bike or a buggy over by that bunker. Refinery takes some more damage, and uh, Haru Specs not actually pushing into this location just yet. Looks like he was maybe trading some blows with One Vision. One Vision also standing on the Tiberium and taking some damage on his infantry there. 
Haru Specs bringing in more dev tanks, descents, and gunwalkers. Sort of a little bit of everything going on here. His descents trying to close the distance, but there are some militant squads making that a bit troublesome. If the Descents could close the distance with these Scorpion tanks, he would be able to crush through this army pretty nicely. Nice and efficient for Haru Specs, but One Vision has pretty good numbers. He's circling around these buildings. These buildings making things kind of difficult, and Haru Specs commits into the attack there, and now everything is just getting focused and destroyed. Haru Specs actually pulls that off, and One Vision plays right into his hand. I'm not sure if something happened there with the pathing or what. A couple of flame tanks going to be coming in here. The warp chasm potentially under threat. It's going to go down, but no, the orcas come in. They don't quite get the kill on the flame tank, but now it's out of range of the warp chasm when barely any health. The tripod takes it down. The other flame tank escapes away, and Green Zero shows up. Whoa, where did he get 20 predator tanks from? He just shows up in the middle of nowhere with Pred APC, and he is ready to tango against against Panda. And well, this might be the game where the comeback starts. Pred APC going to be cycling down. He's going to be losing a couple of units here sort of almost accidentally against the rocket squads of Panda. And Haru Specs continuing to push in against One Vision, Scorpion tanks and Dev tanks tangoing in the south. But is this enough gunwalkers to really break the front line? The answer is no, as Haru Specs retreats away and Green Zero giving away unit after unit, just running them past that forest of rocket squads. He's been able to cut through the main base of, or the original main base of Panda. I mean, everything has pretty much been relocated up here to the northern position. And Green Zero just gave away a good number of tanks as he drove past that area, but now he's kind of got Panda surrounded. He could even sneak down, potentially take down those Tiberium spikes. And at this point, he's going to try a sort of three-pronged attack coming in here from the south, from the north, and he's going to be potentially hitting the Harvesters as well. No, the Harvesters are safe for now, but Aggressive Panda continuing to drive around with his Harvesters, not really paying attention as they just get targeted down by those APCs. Rocket Squad's getting some more volleys off against these Predators as the APCs cycle around to try and deal with them. And this is, uh, this is a lot of Rocket Squads for Aggressive Panda. He may be able to shut this down with just the units that he's got out on the field right now. Green Zero, the reinforcements from the side never really came through for him. But at the same time, the Orcas have come through for him in this game and in others. He's even going to get the power plant as well. And a couple of bikes coming through for One Vision. Going to be able to clean up one Harvester for sure. Maybe even a second Harvester unless he's got a phase ready to save that Harvester. The second Harvester ready to unload. But also these bikes ready to unload as Panda has been defeated. One Vision has been defeated and they give up on that game. That would have been a long one to fight out, but they potentially could have done it. However, the comeback begins. Green Zero and Haru Specs point, put a point on the board. And if they play the rest of the games like that, then that will definitely be something that they can come back with. Look at that, dominating the eco graph. But uh, honestly, that wasn't because a ton of money was... Actually, they did harvest a good amount. I mean, almost 100k, so... And that is a good amount, but really shutting down Panda's economy, that constant harassment, that uh, Pitbull Orca rush that Green Zero pulled off really did the trick to completely hamstring Panda. And then it was up to One Vision, who was trading fairly evenly with Haru Specs, but uh, not enough to take on everything all at once like that. But that's game number three, sealed and done. Hope is alive. Let's see where it goes in game number four. Which takes us back to downtown Dust Bowl in the northern position as the orange GDI. This is Green Zero. And we'll just go around the clock regardless of what teams people started on. But as the blue screen, this is Haru Specs. And in the south, as the green GDI, this is is aggressive panda wow refinery first that is not crazy but it is a little surprising and i guess it's not uh totally refinery first but no barracks at least as the uh purple nod this is one vision or maybe he dropped that power plant just as we arrived okay so that's the play Ha! Huh. Again, no AP ammo. Could just be for orcas. 
It's a curious thing to do. Okay, so immediately, you know, green zero, maybe even with a delayed scout himself, but he's got the pit bull, he's got the rifleman, so this will be seen. And this is, wow, this is okay. We are going that crazy with this. No tip spikes on this map. Looks like Green Zero is aware of this now. He's like, oh, oh, this is a lot of firepower. Double War Factory bike buggy, MCV cells, double airfield orcas. They are looking to seal this one up quick. Panda and One Vision think their best shot at taking this game is going to be the rush, is going to be the surprise factor. They get one Harvester very nicely there. The Pitbulls show up, but they're getting gunned down one by one by these bikes and these buggies, and that may be it for Green Zero. The defense might be a little bit too late here from Haru Specs. Green Zero has literally no Harvesters. He's got one Refiner. He's in low power mode, and he's going to be able to produce those Pitbulls, but not necessarily do too much more than that. Panda himself is about to be knocked out of this ick economically at least. He's going to be completely out. No more Harvester for him. He's got that one GDI engineer crossing the map, but it's going to be terrible damage on all sides as One Vision shows up with some bike buggy. He's going to be able to strike down a Harvester, and maybe even Panda will get an additional Harvester here as his Orcas do some pretty good damage. And the Seeker tanks, they're not enough to scare off those bikes. That engineer just hanging out down in the south there. The bikes commit to the ring around the Rosie, but the Orcas are going to get the kill, able to fly over the buildings and yes you've got the anti-ground but you don't have the anti-air the harvesters all going down green zero trying to put something together here and he mcv sold he is out of this and i don't know where his engineer went but he is heading for something and he is just going to see what he can get engineer running through the tiberium the engineer may get literally nothing one way or the other this game is going to be over pretty darn quickly mcv cells all around engineers running around the map with the potential to change the game with a single engineer cap but will it actually happen Green Zero, he's got the War Factory, but it looks like he is out of cash. What a map to MCV sell on. At least if you've got a Tib Spike on the map, you can use your Engineer, and Haru Specs has been defeated. It's all up to Green Zero, who's got basically nothing left. It looks like Panda and One Vision are going to be going into the semifinals of the 2v2 World Championship. Green Zero with nothing left, taps the GG, and he is out. Panda and One Vision with an Orca Double War Factory MCV cell all in. Clinch it in game number four, just under four minutes. What a crazy fast game coming out after some pretty standard game after game after game. I guess that last one was a little different, an airfield rush from Green Zero. But other than that, pretty standard from every single player, every single game until a total explosion at the end there. And what a way to go into the semifinals. They have earned their spot. But who will they be against? We have one more quarterfinal to get to. We have one more team to see advance to the next round. And game one of quarterfinal D is on Tiberium Pantanus, if I'm saying that correctly. Our final 2v2 of the quarterfinals to see our final four teams. Ooh, we have got ourselves a mutant hovel quite close to where you spawn, but in the northern position as the cyan nod. This is Monster Tamer. Their teammate just to the south as the pink GDI. This is Plan Eden. Now scrolling all the way to the other half of the map, we do have as the orange screen, Dune Tiger. And as the red nod, this is Bike Rush Owns. which if you have not seen the 1v1 tournament, he was indeed a finalist. Were some good games in that tournament for sure. And it would definitely be strange if Bike Rush Owens died here in the quarterfinals. So the task is set before Monster Tamer and Plan Eden to really pull something out of this game. It is, uh, it is certainly their game to win. They are the underdogs, and sort of, if they die here, it's like, well, you were against Spike Rochones in the quarterfinals. Dune Tiger is certainly no slouch as well. He can uh, often go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best of them, so he may not quite be on the same level as Spike Rochones, but he is definitely a good player, and so this is a tough team to beat. It's sort of a... Uh, 
a potential finalist team that you're getting stacked up against in the quarterfinals. Whereas, honestly, none of the none of the series were particularly easy. Like on the other side of the bracket, if you get stacked up against Drive and Futurama, it's like, well, it's not much different. A lot of MCV damage to Bike Rush owns. We may have spoken too soon. Okay, there's the emergency deployment. It's not where he wanted to be with that MCV, but it is going to allow him to get the bikes off of his back. He can pack back up immediately, and he's even going to drop his power plant there, which uh, often you move your MCV a little bit before getting the power plant anyways. You just don't intend on taking all of that damage. Once again, this command post sell-off build where you just go for the Orcas, you get the upgrade on the power plant, a fast Orca play. Uh, I don't know if Plan Eden did it exactly correctly. It looks like he maybe spent too much cash on some other stuff. I don't know exactly, but I think you're supposed to have more Orcas, and I don't think your Orcas are supposed to be zeroing out your bank account as they are here for Plan Eden. So I don't know... It seems like this Orca Rush is a little bit sticky. It seems like the Orca Rush is a little bit slow. And uh, we'll see how it continues to develop. Bike Rush owns, on the other hand, going to have to drop a Hand of Nod, drop for an Engineer. And the bikes may not actually get the kill on the Engineer. They decide to not stick around. They're not going to sacrifice themselves to do more damage. And, of course, the Engineer gets the full repair anyway, so it doesn't matter. It's not like it costs more to, uh, to do a partial repair with an Engineer or a more repair with an engineer. Plan Aiden's MCV is on the move to the blue field, which is gonna be a curious choice. The Orcas decide to engage with the bikes and the buggies. Uh, a very, a very curious choice. Not, maybe not the best tactical decision there. Uh, this might be a build that fell apart there. Unless I'm, unless I'm missing something. The Orcas are supposed to be three and they're supposed to be hitting the harvesters, and they're supposed to be pit bulls or something with them. Uh, I think Plan Eden maybe didn't quite get this. Not that things are donezo, but I think maybe he's just behind where he wanted to be at this point in the game. And when you're on even footing with Bike Rochons, you're sort of already behind, so if you're behind against Bike Rochons, you're sort of really behind. Uh, all right, so Monster Tamer and Plan Eden are sort of on Tier 1. And there's a Warp Chasm and an Eradicator Hexapod about halfway done. It doesn't bode well for them, although Plan Eden, you know what I love when someone steals that Blue Tiberium. I won't lie, I don't know that stealing Blue Tiberium is going to be enough outright. Uh, but, hope springs eternal, and this is into Descents. Descents for that maximum damage output, although the range is not fantastic. The damage output is lovely. Alright, Monster Tamer, he is a believer in Bike Buggy. Bike Buggy can be defeated by a thing called Base Defenses. Uh, and it doesn't really leave you with a lot of options to kill off this Eradicator Hexapod, which uh, is going to have at least one Corruptor Heal in it, maybe more. At this point, you really want EMPs. You really want some uh, EMP artillery kind of options. I thought I heard a Catalyst Missile firing off, and it looks like Bike Rushones is going to be losing a couple of Harvesters here. Two Harvesters going down. That's a decent chunk of Bike Rush's economy, but he's got that entire first field under his belt, and he's got a pretty safe expansion potentially behind this Eradicator Hexapod. There isn't a lot of support for this Eradicator Hexapod. I expected the Corruptors to actually be with it, sort of healing it from the beginning. And this Eradicator Hexpod may just end up getting eliminated here. We'll have to see if it goes for a crush on these Predator tanks. They're moving up really close to the Eradicator Hexapod in crushing range. And, well, I guess you've always got that in your back pocket, that phase, so you can just sort of go in, tank a bunch of damage, deal a bunch of damage, and then phase right there at the quarter health marker and save yourself quite nicely. But that does reveal, hey, there's an Eradicator Hexapod here. You might want to potentially get EMP grenades or something to try and uh, lock this baby down. Uh, EMP coils could be on the way here. 
He's researching something. It might be laser capacitors, but it should be either tip core or laser or EMP coils. So one of those two things. Bike Rush Owens gets his own Harvester kill, taking a little bit of revenge for what happened to him earlier. And more Harvesters coming to the front line. I don't know that this is necessarily a great idea for Monster Tamer. He's going to just kind of rely on his bike buggy a moving to uh, sort of auto attack and not overkill too much, which is pretty good. I mean, he cleaned up everything that was there. Harvesters took some damage, but no guaranteed kills, which means, hey, if you escape with the Harvester and the Harvester is still alive, that counts as a pretty good move. Storm Column is here. Dune Tiger continuing to push with this Eradicator Hexapon. And at this point, Plan Eden has just been sort of trying to get his feet under him. This is a lot of Corruptors here on the front line. If you try and commit to attack the Corruptors, you get real up close and personal with the with the Disintegrators inside of this Eradicator Hexapod. And goodbye, Rocket Squads. They pretty much all go down. The Corruptors could actually just turn around and deal with those Rocket Squads themselves. Big bike buggy swing in from the north as they're going to be here to support this Eradicator Hexapod. It is Tib Core. That was the upgrade. And if all these bikes fire off at once, they will do some good damage. Plant even loses his War Factory. And this Eradicator Hexapod is uh, unsupported at the current moment. Once again, it's going to be able to take a lot of damage. Will it actually go down or will it get whisked away at a moment's notice? Always something you have to keep in account. And uh, no EMPs to lock it down, which is, again, a bit unfortunate. Bike Rush Owns now going to be swinging through, does some damage, but again, doesn't actually kill anything necessarily. Trades out bike for bike against Monster Tamer, and Monster Tamer going to be losing another Harvester. It was great when Monster Tamer and Plant Eden were on the other side of the map doing damage, killing stuff of Bike Rushes and of Dune Tigers. But for the last couple of minutes, it's been Bike Rush and Dune Tiger really dictating the pace and keeping Plan Eden and Monster Tamer on their toes. All right, this is the play from Plan Eden. He does not have a whole lot going on, but he does have a Marv out on the field. There is a big Tiberian field just to the south. He's got Grenadier, he's got Zone Troopers, and he's got Double Engineer inside of this Marv. So it's going to be Epic Unit versus Epic Unit. This buys even more time for a potential Redeemer to come out from Monster Tamer, and that is where things start to even out. That Rage Gen on the Redeemer, the EM, MP coils. These are the tools that Monster Tamer needs uh, to try and do something. This is a little bit unfortunate. This MCV getting caught completely exposed. The Redeemer Engineering Facility, or the Reclamator Hub, excuse me, getting sold off immediately, of course, to get the Zone Troopers out, which means it is do or die for Plan Eden. He's got a barracks over there, and he's got some units over there, but no War Factory, no MCV, no other production than barracks. He's got a little bit of economy, and now he's got a Marv to soak up this green Tiberium field. May even get himself a couple of Harvester kills if he gets the Stealth Reveal. He calls in the support power. Might as well keep the armory around for that. Get the rest of your upgrades just to have them. Uh, and yeah, yeah, you can always grab an engineer. You can always take someone's building and try and do something that way. Harvesting this field, it's so tempting, but you can very easily get caught as this Marv is about to be kind of sandwiched potentially between, oh, here come the EMPs. If you kill this militant squad, it doesn't actually help you. They should just be coming back as an Awakened Squad, and uh, the EMP may not actually be necessary. This this Eradicator Hexpot is doing so much damage. It just it just killed that Marv. A double Vet Eradicator Hexpot with the Descents inside does so much damage. Plan Eden was able to get a chunk of that Tiberium field, denying it from Bike Rush Owns, denying it from Dune Tiger but they have got a lot of stuff to worry about. Great use of the stealth field support power there to clean up that little group of rocket squads. Reverse move bug, it looks like killing off that one seeker tank in the north there. And it's Bike Rush Owns versus Monster Tamer. It's the king of a bike buggy. Rift Generator gets deployed and uh, Tip Catalyst Missile fires off, catches that refinery, maybe even catches a bike or a buggy. It looks like one may have gone down. Bike Rush Owns going to be swinging in. He's going for the kill of the Harvesters. He doesn't mind trading out some of these units, probably, if he can cut down the economy of his opponent. Never mind, he's going past the Harvesters. He doesn't want to die on that field. He wants to go here and see if he can get some damage without taking much damage. And the answer is no. He's just slowly cycling out these bikes. He's just slowly using, losing unit by unit. 
Plan Eden still in this game technically, but uh, not much to do in this game. We'll be able to clean up a beam cannon, which is nice. The Marv going down was the last big tough unit that Plan Eden had. Uh, really the only big tough unit that Plan Eden had throughout this game. It looks like Plan Eden has a bit of a parking lot outside of one of his refineries. So at least he'll have a decent amount of cash. And this is now a fully heroic Eradicator Hexapod. And somewhere on the map is a Mastermind which can blink it away in a moment's notice. And well, this is going to be a tough fight what is it inside? Was that sniper teams that got unloaded there? I'm not actually sure. But, uh, or no, I guess just one of the rocket squads or one of the riflemen got eliminated. Bike Buggy gets destroyed as Dune Tiger calling in an Overlord's Wrath that actually hit a considerable amount of units. I mean, it's Bike Buggy, so it probably came out, like, cost negative when you consider, consider the Tiberium that you get out of that Overlord's Wrath, the little mini Tiberium field that spawns. That gives your opponents a nice little group of, a nice little bit of cash. And goodbye Tiberium Spike. Bike Roshone's pulling a couple of more bikes down south. Plan Eden, he has got the big rocket squad, big rifleman numbers. It's like he's playing Napoleonic VIP, but everyone else is just playing the game normally. And the unfortunate thing is that he doesn't get to zone raid, zone troopers. If he had zone troopers, Plan Eden, if he had like three barracks and he had access, access to zone troopers, Plan Eden would be a serious force in this game. He wouldn't necessarily be winning the game by himself, but he would have enough firepower and enough production that he could put some serious damage out on the field. And, uh, you know, avatars, they go down pretty quick to zone troopers if you've got a decent number of them. But for now, it's going to be riflemen, rocket squads. I'm sure they've got all the upgrades. Oh, no! He doesn't have AP ammo because he sold off the uh, he sold off the command post before he got AP ammo because the Orca Rush, and now his riflemen they don't get that extra bit of damage. Oh boy, Dune Tiger has got a ton of firepower. That Scren Air Armada is a tough thing to deal with. Bike Roshone's gonna have to draft some towers to deal with this little attack. He's got his own couple of bikes and buggies really just bikes and so he's just sort of trading one-to-one -one with uh with monster tamer and rift generator three minutes 40 seconds six minutes uh, well seven minutes really on the nuke but both players from the left side of the map have their super weapons and well there is going to be the shredder turret going down and some of the awakened squads finally coming out onto the field and hey you get those emps that's a nice way to shut down whatever your opponent has got. Redeemer, you know, there's no EMP, or there's no uh, Marv out on the field, but it's a nice way to shut down the Redeemer. All right, it's a bunch of stuff that shoots down versus not very much stuff that shoots up. Rocket squads are here, but Devastator warships do okay versus them. Maybe not when they're that close. Uh, the planetary assault carriers will really deal with them when they're that close. There are a couple of bikes and buggies here. Devastator Warship's going to try and chew through the buildings while the packs deal with the stuff that's on the floor. Unfortunately, no supersonic airstrike to help clear out this air fleet. Rocket Squad's showing up from Plan Eden, and this is the last hurrah. This is the big stand from our team on the right side. And even the, the Seeker tanks with that Shard Launcher upgrade going to be making an appearance to cut down the Harvesters, to cut down the refineries. And that will do it. GG gets called. Monster Tamer and Plan Eden are out of the game. Game number one goes to Bike Rush Owns and Dune Tiger. A bit of an unfortunate start there for Plan Eden and Monster Tamer, but... They did not give up. They did not fall apart. They put on a good show, and they honestly did a really good job of fighting back. Monster Tamer had an idea there. You know, the bike buggy, it's something that you can do a lot with, and it doesn't cost as much. But the trouble is, the unfortunate thing for them is while they were trying to distract with bike buggy, their opponents were going up to Tier 3, going up to Tier 4, getting out epic units, and taking the rest of the map. And uh, Monster Tamer and Planning just didn't quite have that in them. So let's see what they have planned for game number two. Which takes us to the map, Murderer's Row. 
I do believe this is a, this is an official map as well. So this uh, comes with the game, as far as I know. In the uh, well northwest position, as the cyan screen, this is Monster Tamer. This is going to be an east versus west map. And this one is a little bit weird, partially because of the amount of Tiberium that's on the map. As the pink GDI, this is Plan Eden. And he is indeed getting scouted completely by the orange GDI. This is Dune Tiger. And rounding out our four players as the red GDI, this is Bike Rush Owns. Double GDI, so Dune Tiger kind of changing things up from Scrin to GDI against a Scrin GDI. So we'll have to see exactly what Monster Tamer has planned now that he has switched away from Nod. I don't know uh, what cho what kind of prompted him them to swap factions. You know, uh, Bike Rochon switching over to GDI, Dune Tiger, Monster Tamer changing as well. Right for into the blue field. Blue Tiberium in the middle of the map goes Plan Eden, and it's going to be into Descents. Okay. All right. I'm loving what I'm seeing. I don't know if it will work, but Monster Tamer and Plan Eden, they had a plan going into game number one. They had a specific build. Hey, they're doing it again! Okay, so he's going to fuel it with Blue Tiberium this time. And Dune Tiger is like, hey man, sell off this stupid watchtower. What do you even need it for? Sends a hundred beacons onto the map. And they're going to fuel it with Blue Tiberium, which honestly is going to work in theory a lot better. Or maybe a little bit better. The drive time is very far, so it's not exactly like double income. With the drive time, it's probably like 1.6 times income. Like one and two thirds. So I think it's still advantageous. But uh, it's not it's not as advantageous as you might think, with Blue Tiberium being worth twice as much as uh, Green Tiberium. The Secret Tanks are going to be punching directly down Bike Rush's throat as uh, Monster Tamer just takes his fist and just rams it right into Bike Rush's face. The unfortunate thing is that uh, his fist was actually made of paper, and that was about it. Oh! Oh, he's got descents inside of the APCs! The sick blaze! 100% impossible to do in a 1v1. I guess not 100%. You could grab the tech from your opponent, and they're going for the kill on the Conyard! Dune Tiger is getting jumped in the middle of the map. He thought, hey, I want to have fun with the Blue Tiberium as well, and he is just getting jumped on. Check this out. Even a Guardian Cannon coming in. The Orca Strike going to be able to finish off that MCV. No engineers produced, which is good for Dune Tiger. And a couple of ejects missed for those descents. When the APC is low on health, when it's about to die, you want to eject the unit out of it so that you do save it. However, in the heat of battle, we definitely all forget to do that. And Plan Eden could have gotten a little bit of extra damage out of Monster Tamer's uh, descents if he had been able to do that. Unfortunately, also leaving a Harvester here with this Predator tank is another sort of uh, unfortunate thing that happens. Monster Tamer getting some good damage out of this lightning spike, going to be absorbing some of the credits of Dune Tiger by killing off this power plant. Dune Tiger does have a war factory, so he will be able to get, an up, um, get up an MCV, but it does severely delay whatever he had planned for the rest of the game. Either you don't build the MCV and you're limited to tier one tech, or you spend the cash, you get the MCV, and uh, you tie up your war factory for that entire time, so the rest of your game is delayed by a good bit. Bike Rush Owns, on the other hand, going to be dropping the Tier 3 tech center in the middle of the map. So he says, this is mine. I will defend the middle of the map because my literal end game, my late game tech is here. Lightning Spike going to be getting some more free damage off against this Harvester. But, uh, well, goodbye Lightning Spike. He can't stand up to a Sonic Emitter. Trying to do what he can. Monster Tamer just, you know, putting out that little bit of damage here and there. But, uh, well, that attack was probably supposed to go a little bit better than that. Plan Eden and Monster Tamer hoping to put some more damage out onto the field. I love that Plan Eden is going for these defensive turrets as well. You might as well add as much defense as you can get 
you are going to need it. Once again, the Marv is out this time for Bike Rush owns. And, well, EMP is the way to go. Do these players actually have EMP? I think the answer is no. As the crane is going to be getting targeted, a great catch here by Plan Eden. Ejects out the disintegrators and even has a fully heroic disintegrator squad inside of that other APC. He gets the kill on that crane and he even gets the drop of the mines to try and kill off the predator tank and it works. Oh, this poor disintegrator squad gets just ripped apart. Never mind, it gets completely eliminated. Fully heroic and yet dead. Very unfortunate there as the Marv closes in, kills three harvesters as the engineers make their way across the dangerous Tiberium, but Bike Rush doesn't even care. He says, send in the engineers. They will solve all of my problems, and indeed they will. Goodbye. Uh, Monster Tamer's base, pretty much. He is going to have to pull something out miraculous. He has got basically no ground army, and he have it has a Marv knocking on his front door. Dune Tiger has taken back the middle of the map. He tried it once. He got stomped. He tried it a second time, and, well, it actually worked out pretty well because Bike Rush Owns had already helped him clear out the middle of the map, and that is that. Plan Eden has got his own Reclamator hub. He's got his own Sonic emitters. He's going to try and hold the line. And, of course, he's got these defensive turrets to keep a watch on his base for the current moment. He's got a decent amount of harvesters on that main field. But, unfortunately, Monster Tamer never really was able to grab much of his own big Tiberium field. So he didn't have a lot of cash to uh, keep up with Bike Rush Owns and Dune Tiger, who have both harvested the majority of their big green Tiberium fields that you start on. And it just didn't quite work out as well for Monster Tamer and for Plan Eden. Bike Rush Owns, seeing the beacon of Dune Tiger, is like, well, I guess that's where my late game economy is going to be entirely on that field. There's the sell-off of the Reclamator Hub by Plan Eden. And he can go ahead and Marvis this field here, get a nice little eco boost if that's something he needs. Four Predator tanks sneaking into the back of Plan Eden's base, and they're going to get themselves two Harvesters pretty easily, maybe even a third Harvester if they decide to stick around. The barracks gets either sold off or destroyed there, so no more rocket squads coming out of that thing. Three Harvesters down... Four Harvesters down, and Dune Tiger have brought his MCV along for the ride, brought a Sonic Emitter, so the attack is not going to stop. Double Sonic Emitter. This guy is brutal as he is tearing Plan Eden apart. Triple Sonic Emitter and just blasting down building after building. Now the MCV is the next threat. Man, <laughs> those Sonic Emitters all turning in sequence to uh, fire upon the MCV was a terrible, terrible thing to see. That is almost as bad as this Marv coming in from the north. Plan, Be Plan Eden is going to try and stand against the forces of Bike Rush Owns, but it's so much support. Juggernauts, Zone Troopers, and everything on the map. He's even giving away some APCs to get the mines. The Shockwave Artillery locks down Bike Rush's Marv. But, of course, there was no escape one way or the other. Bike Rush Owns and Dune Tiger take a swift 2-0 lead. But this is a best of five Monster Tamer. And Plan Eden have a chance to put a point on the board, to start the comeback, and to knock out Bike Rush Owns and Dune Tiger. If they manage to do that, it would be an absolutely amazing story. It would be something completely un unseen, a complete upset in this tournament but right now dominating the resource graph by quite a ways bike rush owns and dune tiger are both looking prime to take that game number three and run into the semifinals. but let's see what happens which takes us to the map backwater brawl not some not one that we see very often but another official map as the green screen this is monster tamer and their ally as the pink, as the GDI, this is Plan Eden. As the red GDI, this is Bike Rush Owns, making up team number two. 
And our fourth player rounding out team number two as the orange GDI with the power plant on the high ground. This is Dune Tiger. Power plant on the high ground. Always nice to see. I don't know why it even matters, but uh, why not? Okay. Ha. Huh. So this has been spotted. Biker Jones realize it's been spotted, and the buzzer is going to see it again. So, uh, yeah, if Bike Rush Owns would have kept driving, it would have been spotted, but now the Surveyor has been seen regardless. And what do you have planned, Plan Eden? Is it going to be like the other two games, Orcas quickly onto the map, or is it going to be something else? Bloodhounds getting called in. Dune Tiger and Bike Rush Owns, they are doing something weird. They are going fast, Airfield. They want to end this game quickly. And, well, based on the other two games, I think that should indeed happen. What is this surveyor? Is the surveyor gone? No, it's right there. It's almost deployed. What does Bike Rush Owns have planned? Is it just going to be base defenses from the high ground, or does he? He's going to drop a barracks, and it is going to be a guardian cannon as well. Let the madness begins. Uh, begin. Hey, where did the... Okay, I was like... Where did the Bloodhounds go? It looks like they just took some damage from the Lightning Spike. And that was pretty much it. Orca Strike coming in. Monster Tamer drops the beacon. He's like, I don't know if you've seen this, but take a look. Command Post is here for Plan Eden as well. No upgrades, though. No airfield on the way. It's the Barracks instead. All right, the Bloodhounds come back in. They're trading with that Seeker. Um, I guess I guess there is no plan. Bike Rush Owns is just doing nothing. He got the barracks. He got the Guardian Cannon. And he's like, nah, just kidding. And he's just he, like, he did something weird. And he totally upset Plan Eden. But I guess Plan Eden is just going to be like, nah, whatever. So I guess you just go into a normal game from here but it is uh, very weird from this point on one harvester going down and uh, this is actually a fast tech into dev tanks so the war factory is over here there are no extra harvesters huh monster tamer uh, isn't dead per se but he's dead adjacent uh, I don't, I don't know, normally you get out m more harvesters, I guess all of the harvesters just went down. I assume this is a harvester here. No Tiberium Spike for Monster Tamer, this one unclaimed by anyone at this point. Rocket Squad standing in the Tiberium over there. Reinforcements getting called in for Bike Rush, having to readjust the landing at the last moment there. And, well... Dev tank goes down. And Monster Tamer has been defeated. Plan Eden gets himself a harvester right at the last moment there. Finally finishes once uh, Monster Tamer had a bit of cash on hand. APC gets eliminated. And uh, Plan Eden is going to have a tough time taking this one to the next level. Uh, he's sticking around in the game. Just in case. Bike Rochon's going the infantry route. Uh, Bike Rochon's is actually going to take a lot of damage from these riflemen. If only there were more than just two of them firing upon this entire army. Uh... Are they just BMing each other? <laughs> he just flew his orcas over a war factory and, like, gave them a hold command. Uh, so this appears to be some good old-fashioned BM. Coming out, Bike Rush Owns is going to take the building. And uh, Bike Rush Owns just sort of running around his units, force firing on the ground. And, well, he's harvested up one entire Tiberium field. He's working on his second. And Plan Eden, well, he's got almost one Tiberium field, but he's got less refineries and it's uh, it's hard to win the game with less refineries Dune Tiger actually doesn't have a lot of eco at all <laughs> he's got like one harvester 
And I guess he sold off his MCV to make this happen, so I guess that's why the power plant was on the high ground. Uh, I'm not... I don't know what's going on. Bike Rochones is playing this super weird. Uh, he could have pretty much crippled Plan Eden a minute ago, but he decided not to. Dune Tiger unintentionally crippled himself? I'm not sure. Maybe intentionally crippled himself? And now Dune Tiger and Bike Rush are fighting each other. So they're like dunking on themselves. They're, they're just like standing over Plan Eden, who's like beaten and bruised on the ground, and he's looking at his friend Monster Tamer, who's just dead. And Dune Tiger leaves the game, but he doesn't leave the game so that Bike Rush Owns gets his stuff. He sells everything off and he leaves the game so that all of his stuff gets destroyed. And now... The Dune Tiger is like plain dead, and Plan Eden is looking over at his actual friend who's really dead, and Dune Tiger is just mocking Plan Eden. Uh, unless there's something happening in the in game chat that we can't see, this is a very bizarre game. I mean, at the very least, you know, force firing on the ground and then attacking your ally and leaving the game are both very strange. I don't know what this game is. Uh, the game was over, but it's still going. Like, as... I guess Bike Rush Owns and Dune Tiger are like throwing the game? in a way, but like not in a normal throwing of the game kind of way. Well, Bear Drone's coming down for Plan Eden, one of the advantages of having two tech trees. Bike Rochon's going to be focusing down these Pitbull, these Predator tanks and these Gunwalkers. So he will be able to do that. He's not actually throwing the game, throwing the game. He's just playing it very bizarrely. I'm not sure what the thing was with Dune Tiger and Bike Rochon's attacking each other for a moment there. Like, clearly something is going on that we can't quite see, either because it's happening in a Discord chat or it's happening in the in-game chat. But I guess this is like a split map scenario. Technically, Bike Rochon's is down a Tiberium Spike, so... I think he's got more harvesters and more refineries overall. He's uh, certainly harvested more Tiberium at this phase of the game. But Monster Tamer actually has a, a decent chunk of an army, and Bike Rochon's is mostly infantry, so while he maybe has equal numbers, he doesn't have equal quality of units. And when it comes to actually killing stuff off, he can't quite uh, kill his opponent at the rate that his opponent can kill him. Bike Rochon's actually doesn't have any cash. So Bike Rochon's is making very weird strategic decisions. But he also isn't, like, floating. He's pretty low on cash. He's not transferring harvesters. So I guess Bike Rochon's loses the army in the north. And he's gonna... He's going to save his MCV with infantry. Watchtower goes down, and then he just sells it off immediately. All right, Predator tanks, rocket squads, and riflemen all going to be circling this little army that Plan Eden has. And this is lights out for Plan Eden's army. Plan Eden has a second group of units in the south here. He's pulled the old one-two punch. He's drawn Bike Rush Owns out of position, and he's going to get the drop on a couple of these heroic rocket squads as well, which is nice. Of course, Bike Rush Owns completely crushes the army in the north, and Plan Eden is going to try and juke through the middle of the map to, I guess, avoid fighting Bike Rush Owns full force in the south. 
or something, but Bikrashon's just, you know, reconfigures his forces and... Plan Eden is also apparently spending all of his cash. I think part of this is this game is playing out super weird, and then part of it is everyone is kind of low on cash. Uh, Plan Eden... Should, this is a lot of... He's got a good number of harvesters and... Maybe the refineries are all glitched? Yeah, because everyone is completely empty on their refineries. Okay, yeah, Planion has seven grand. Bikrashones is spending all of his money. So Bikrashones is legitimately out of money, but the uh, the Tiberium level indicator, I guess because he has so many refineries, it's just not even registering, even though he has seven grand in the bank. Um, This isn't even a real game at this point. I guess now it is, but we took some bizarre leaps and bounds to get here that it doesn't feel like a real game. Plan Eden does actually have a decent amount of stuff, and he's going to be able to get a couple of kills on these harvesters. Also, the repair drones are going to be fantastic once his units actually step into their range. So that's basically his repairs right there on the front line. Bike Rochones is choosing to not engage with the entirety of his army. He's also choosing to not build any base defenses. This is not the defensive bike rush that we typically see. This is, I think, a, uh, a version of bike rush which is making some bizarre choices, but also Plan Eden might be, you know, kind of in on it. I hope this isn't disparaging to Plan Eden. I hope this is all in good fun. But this is definitely a uh, one for the books, one way or the other. Uh, I guess this is a game. This isn't a game, but I guess. Yeah. So, we'll go to game three, part two. Like, normally, if there's a problem with the game, the players leave the game and you regame. Hey, the Marv came out. Wow. Railguns, mammoth tanks. Plan Aiden is spending his cash on something. He's gonna hunt the uh, hunt the tip spike. So I mean, but now Plan Eden isn't even doing anything. His Marv is just sitting there. His Mavitex are just sitting there. Like instead of actually responding to the threat of bike rush, he's just sitting around. I guess he's responding, but in, like, the worst way possible. So it's like a double throw. Like, Bike Rush Owns was throwing the game, but then Plan Eden was also kind of throwing the game, and... I guess that was a game. So let's see what happens in game number three, for real. Which takes us to the map GDI Space Command which is another one that I have never actually seen a competitive match on. Definitely looks a little bit like a campaign map in the north as the pink GDI. This is Plan Eden. And as uh, somewhere on the map, as the Cyan Scrin, this is Monster Tamer. Once again, this one is kind of set up like a uh, four-player FFA map. You're quite separated from your ally. But as the red nod, this is Bike Rush Owns. And as the orange nod somewhere, this is Dune Tiger. All right, game three or game four, who knows what it actually is. But this is a game. We're on a new map. We're on a different map. You get a Tib Spike at the back of your base. I think this is a community-made map, and you've got Tib Spikes here. I don't know, maybe it's not. Maybe this is an official map, but it doesn't look like it. But it does look like one of the campaign or one of the challenge maps. There's definitely a, an official map that looks similar to this, but I don't remember if it's a campaign. 
uh, if it's a campaign mission or if it's like a uh, one of the maps that's in the rotation for Global Conquest. Which, if you are looking to play some Kane's Wrath, you want to mix things up from your typical 1v1s or uh, online games or your skirmishes. Glo Global Conquest is a great, very fun game mode to uh, chill out with and play. Kind of wish there was another level to it because, you know, you're kind of just playing skirmishes versus the AI. But it is definitely a fun game mode, kind of like uh, Napoleonic VIP to kind of mix things up with every once in a while. Great to see that. I guess there are also four blue Tiberium fields. So you would look at this map, and it's very bizarre kind of setup. You've got weird entrances and exits to your base with these bridges. Everyone is so separated away from each other. And your main and your natural are really almost the same thing. You've got an in-base natural expansion, but then no third. I mean, your third is, I guess, this blue Tiberium field, and there is one per player. But, of course, you know, by the time you get done building your natural, there isn't going to be a ton of Tiberium there, but it is going to be blue. In the case of Dune Tiger, he's maybe trying to steal... No, I guess that is Dune Tiger's blue Tiberium field, so he's not really stealing from anyone. He's more just getting his blue Tiberium early. Plan Eden going to be cleaning up this Raider buggy. Gets the kill there. He's got himself three pit bulls running around the map. Now, when you see Bike Rashones and Dune Tiger who've been playing some GDI games, you know, game number one, Nod and Scrin, then double GDI, double GDI, and now it's double Nod, it's hard to imagine that they're not going to just fast tech. I was thinking they were either going to fast tech or double War Factory bike buggy all in and just go all out with it. But honestly, they're not really doing either one. Bike Rush Owns is playing it out very middle of the road, standard, like get out eco first, not a double war factory play or anything like that. And Dune Tiger is much doing the same. They are very much playing the map. You've got an in-base natural expansion and that is how they're playing it. They're not playing like a really fast, I'm going to end the game and just crush you into the dirt. They're just playing a normal game. So the fact that they double switched to Nod, I thought, was a signal of some kind of meta game, the, you know, the match in between the match. But it's really not. They're just sort of playing it out normal. I love this from Plan Eden. He's got his pit bulls there. He is stealing that blue Tiberium from Dune Tiger. Doesn't want to give away the pit bulls. I mean, this is Rocket Squads and Scorpions. You're not going to trade efficiently against them. You got your load of blue Tiberium. You got your win for the day head back home and it looks like this bridge some of these bridges might be unkillable actually i think all of these bridges might be unkillable which is a curious choice uh bridges are typically killable but in this particular map because it's only bridges i mean this one is a land bridge so because the bridges are i guess so central to the game they are uh, unkillable entirely Buzzers do get a complete scout of what Dune Tiger is doing. The short answer is building a lot of Scorpion tanks. The slightly longer answer is probably laser capacitors. He's getting Venoms as well. He's uh, going lots of Scorpion tanks. Something flying in for a bit of a scout. Command post is here. AP ammo is not on the way. Railguns not on the way either, although they may be heading up relatively soon. It could just be the play for the... Uh, Marv. This is a four-part Reckoner attack. I mean, we've seen Reckoners utilized in this way in the past. I think this is what the devs... Five-part Reckoner attack. This is what the devs sort of had in mind when they made Reckoners. They were going to be able to be these mobile bunkers. They were going to be almost battle buses from General Zero Hour back in the game. And, of course, they're really only used for rushes, and then other than that, you just don't see them very much. And this is much more how they were, you know, thought to be used as part of the army in particular strategic ways. Double nuke out on the field, Bike Rashones and Dune Tiger taking once again advantage of the fact that there is lots of cash very close to you and going, you know, epic units, going nukes. And going a little bit nuts with uh, some bizarre choices, the Reckoners being one of them. The tip spike in the middle of the map being claimed by Bike Rush Owns. 
a couple of these Reckoners perhaps getting deployed around the map, and we'll just provide lovely little anti-tank stop points for Bike Rush owns. He just gets some rocket damage out around the map as his own bunkered up buildings. All right, we've got a Redeemer out on the map. I believe two of them just spawned in. At least one did. Yep, there's one here. There's another one over there. The Marv is out, as you already saw, and we all heard the Eradicator Hexapoded one or two minutes ago spawning in. Just got one set of Shock Troopers inside of it. Not actually any more than that. So two blank spots on that uh, Eradicator. Goodbye, Juggernauts. Great strike there by Dune Tiger. Choosing to use those Vertigos to eliminate the artillery is a fantastic move. Zone Troopers, what are you doing, man? Not hanging out inside of that Marv. Crucial there. Losing at least one of those Zone Trooper squads for nothing. The other one finally jumps inside of that Marv, keeping him safe for the current moment. Lightning Spike goes down. Venom's going to be getting some free shots off on this Marv, maybe even clean up some more Zone Troopers. No, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a Quad Zone Trooper Marv! Oh, the plays! Not often do you see four of one unit go into the Marv. If you do, it's four engineers just to make it a maximum damage sponge. But in this case, it is four Zone Troopers into the Marv. And that is something that I am curious to see how it plays out. Plan Eden going with the double MCV play. And now that people are starting to eat up all of their Tiberium that's inside of their main, we'll have to see how they choose to play this. Mind drop directly on top of the Corruptors, directly on top of that Eradicator Hexapod. Huge damage out. Rage Gen fires off. And it looks like that Rage Gen is going to benefit the Eradicator Hexapod just fine. Stealth Field gets dropped down, but the Stasis Shield comes up and eliminates the Eradicator, the uh, Redeemer, from being a part of this fight. Great blink forward! That Eradicator Hexpod stepping on that ray on that Avatar, but I think he actually blinked into the Stasis Shield, so he's getting locked out of the fight. He got one crush, but no more than that. Another Redeemer is back online. Is the EMP going to be good enough? Yes, it is! Monster Chamber locks down Bike Rush Owns Redeemer. He's gonna get the kill, and Bike Rush Owns is gonna have to fire back with his own EMPs. If he can only hit the units online, the Redeemer still stands. It's just got a bit of health left, and Monster Tamer crushing through Bike Rush Owns. The EMPs are starting to fire back as Monster Tamer barely gets the kill. Goodbye, Redeemer, as the, as the Obelisks come up, as Dune Tiger is coming to the rescue of Bike Rush Owns. The phase fires off. Eradicator Hexapod is safe, and Monster Tamer and Plan Eden pulling something out here as the supersonic airstrike comes through orbital bombardment pushing away those scorpion tanks and the venoms are showing up to clean up the rest but the eradicator hexpod needs to get on out of there i'm not sure what monster tamer is doing he activated the phase but then he's just sticking around inside of enemy building range for uh for an unknown reason is he literally stuck on the geometry of the map it looks like oh my gosh he might be stuck because of the obelisk, the MCV, and that statue. That may be a map bug, basically. If that's true, oh man. Oh man. Monster Tamer may have just lost that. Either he, he did a bizarre miscontrol there, like just hanging out for no reason, or there's something about that statue position with the phase that doesn't allow the Eradicator Hexapod to move from that spot. I'm not sure what the deal there was, one way or the other. Monster Tamer loses his Eradicator Hexapod. Those two, those two uh, Scorpion tanks, they're like, hey, let's take on a Marv, and that is not a good choice to make. Not at all. Bike Rush Owns steps forward with his Redeemer. It gets EMP'd, it gets locked down and destroyed. But the game is not over. Dune Tiger is pretty well powered up. We got a minute and 40-ish seconds left on the double nuke from our players in the south. All right, second Eradicator Hexapod is out on the field. There is a, uh, I guess there was a Mastermind inside of the Eradicator Hexapod. I didn't see one elsewhere on the battlefield, but uh, that's a good choice. You know, got that blink forward opportunity. It's uh, not a super clutch move, but it is nice. Ooh. Oh. 
Oh! And this is why most players do not... Yikes. That's why most players stick a couple of engineers inside of that Marv. Those Vertigo Bombers are absolutely deadly. That was a Marv without any support at all. And uh, trying to get some more Awakened Squads is Bike Rush Owns. He really wants to get some Awakened Squads for the EMPs. Sonic Emitter going to be coming down. The drone ship is here. Monster Tamer and Plan Eden making their big play. Once again, this is supposed to be supported by a Marv as well, but it's just not. There's the Mastermind grab of the War Factory and sell it off. Nice little cashback bonus there for Monster Tamer. A great move there. Unfortunately, it looks like the, uh, the, the, the Mastermind also went down there. So a little bit unfortunate, but another Marv is on the way. The Reclamator Hub is here on the front lines, and this Eradicator Hexpod is going to be farming a little bit of veteran C here. Vertigo Bomber showing up, but it's Firehawks in the defense as it's 10 seconds left on the nuke. This Eradicator Hexapod and these Tripods are trying to get up close and personal so that there isn't an option for a safe nuke from Bike Rush Owns. Where does he land the nuke? Where does Dune Tiger land the nuke as this drone ship is definitely a target for this uh, potential nuke? Goodbye drone ship as Dune Tiger's nuke is also counted down to zero. Bike Rush owns, lands the first strike and Dune Tiger choosing not to nuke basically this exact same spot. He might be waiting for the phase to wear off on that Eradicator Hexapod so that he can get the killing blow on everything all at the same time. Raids Gen fires off and the nuke is sure to follow it. But no, the Marv steps out of the Reclamator Hub and goodbye drone ship as it gets eliminated. And uh, that Raids Gen, I don't know if that was actually affecting that Marv when it spawned in that late. The second nuke fires off as well. Direct hit. The Eradicator Hexapod goes down. Monster Tamers, a big army is completely gone. The Zone Riders might jump inside of the Marv, but this is a lot of firepower to contend with without any support. It's going to be hard for Plan Eden to break through the front line of Bike Rush Owns and Dune Tiger. Triple Obelisk trying to get some Awakened Squads out of the deal. There's the EMP, the lockdown of the Marv, trying to keep it in range of the Obelisk, but it wasn't quite able to do that. Spectre Artillery from the back lines, firing shot after shot, and goodbye, Marv. No, it survives! It barely survives! The Spectre Artillery one shot away from ending that Marv, but it manages to get away. The Sonic Emitter's covering its... Path. I cannot believe that Marv legitimately pulled out of there. I mean, like, Vertigo Bombers should just suicide onto the Marv and go for the kill. But uh, the Redeemer is here for Bike Rush Owns. Uh, I'm not sure what his plan is. They fired off their nukes. They're just sort of sitting in their bases. They're not very active on the map like we're used to seeing Dune Tiger and Bike Rush Owns be. They're definitely playing this way this part of the game out much slower paced than we would uh, otherwise see. Dune Tiger is sort of building up apparently the ultimate avatar army. Mar, oh man, the RNG. Oh, roll the dice and everything comes back against you. The shockwave artillery RNG in that we've seen twice now in the quarterfinals of the 2v2 World Championships, just completely getting diced. Man, that the, every blast of the Shockwave Artillery missed the one unit that it was supposed to hit, the one unit it was supposed to EMP, and just completely misses everything. The Marv up to almost half health there. You know, the repair drones are good, but they're not, they're not unbeatable. Uh, once again, things are feeling a little bit weird. Doom Tiger is hanging out in his base for unknown reasons. He's getting a bunch of double beam avatars, which I guess is like a legitimate use of time, but not really. Bike Rush Owns is sort of just hanging out. This is a low econ game, but they're not playing it as actively as they normally do. 
couple of gun walkers are going to go down. The Rage Gen does have a way of chipping away at your armies like that. Just slowly harvesting these three Tiberium fields that everyone has under their control. Surprise, no growth accelerators on the uh, on the fields that are a little bit safer. I guess this blue field is really the only safe one. But I'm surprised that Plan Eden, or Monster Tamer rather, doesn't have more uh, mo growth accelerator around the map. This seems like a good place to actually utilize them. The Marv is still low on health. Somebody's beaconing it for one reason or another. Bikrochon's going to be claiming some of the husks that are around the map. Definitely a good use of engineers to reclaim some units, especially in a low eco game like this. Let's just take a quick look. Monster Tamer's got a grand. Bike Rush has got two and a half. Yeah, Dune Tiger has three and a half. Plant Eden has one and a half. So there's a little bit of cash still in the bank, but not a lot. And not really enough for anyone to really build much of an army with. Dune Tiger, I guess, is that's why he's. We'll say that's why he's getting these super powered avatars. Why he's choosing to, you know, build them all up this way. Militant Squad's going to be shooting that AA turret. And this Rifleman is going to try and trade against the Militant Squads. But for whatever reason, Plan Eden hasn't gotten very many upgrades. I mean, he hasn't gotten AP ammo, which is a staple. You almost never don't get AP ammo. Rage Gen fires off once again. Bike Roshone's just chipping away at the army of Monster Tamer and Plan Eden, the epic unit army over on the right side of the map. Ooh, I do love this from Plan Eden. I mean, it's just going to get nuked by uh, literal nukes if they do see it. But zone heads are so powerful. And this is a good amount of them as well. Well, maybe not these guys, but seriously. Okay, AP ammo is being researched. He's getting it. If you've got hammerheads, you got to get AP ammo. I mean, come on. All right, Monster Tamer is circling around. So I guess there is nine Tiberium Spikes on this map in total. Awakened Squad does get eliminated. Finally, this Reckoner will go down from so long ago in the middle of this map. Hallucinogenic grenades trying to cause some confusion amongst the forces of Monster Tamer. And finally, that tip spike will go down. Orca Strike heading out over the map. And Plan Eden, it looks like he's trying to keep his airborne forces uh, hidden for the current moment. Can't blame him. You do not want to reveal zone heads in this kind of a game if you don't have to. Goodbye, Militant Squad. I don't know how you got that far behind enemy lines, but you did indeed. Looks like Rage Gen firing off once again. Stealthed Double Engineer Redeemer. There's going to be the scan coming in from Plan Eden to see what he sees. The Marv is healed up almost completely with its four Zone Raiders inside of it. Honestly, packing a rig along would be a really good move. All right. Another nuke is ready to go. Nothing has really happened in the last since the last nuke fired off, so. Monster Tamer's army that went into the middle of the map has actually found a bit of a spot. Of course, it can just get nuked. This is a perfect spot to use a nuke. Instead, it's going to get mine dropped. Gunwalkers, Seeker Tanks, everything goes down, and the tripods are going to try and escape along the south side of this central island. I guess that building is getting shelled by... Oh, Spectres, okay. That building that Monster Tamer has held control of for most of this game. Raids Gen fires off. Tripods are going to kill each other. Plan Eden drops a beacon. He says, hey, there's a... And the tripods go down. He's like, hey, there's a Redeemer there. There's a Stealth Generator over there. All right, Nuke fires off. Where is it going to impact? I don't know, but something just got killed. I don't know where Bike Rush sent his Nuke. Dune Tiger still has his. 
Spectre Artillery getting some good shots off against this Marv. Rage Gun fires off once again. The Marv is going to go into Tango with the Redeemer, but this is so much damage from Bike Rush Owns. Monster Tamer going to be swinging around the side, and finally, there's Shockwave Artillery going to be firing off. Will it actually lock down the Redeemer? Yes, it will. Avatars as well. Stealth Generator as well. And the Marv desperately trying to escape while the Eradicator Hexpod comes in behind. But the Tripod is going for the EMP. Goodbye, Eradicator. Hexapod, goodbye Marv as the repeat EMPs from this tripod won't actually save it or won't actually kill it because the tripod goes down and phase goes down on the Eradicator Hexapod. The zone hammerhead army may actually get nuked here. Uh, nope, I guess not. Dune Tiger still holding his nuke in his back pocket may once again choose to nuke the Eradicator Hexapod, take it out of the map. And of course, if you think the nuke is coming for your hammerheads, you slap that X key a number of times. You just got to separate them out. And well, that is exactly what he just did. Nuke fires off on the edge of Dune Tiger's own base. And uh, well, it doesn't quite do as much as he had hoped. It misses the majority of the hammerheads. I guess they do bait out the nuke in that way. And well... Bike Rush owns... Oh, if only they could see that Harvester. It would have insta-killed it. Ooh, Zone Raiders. More Zone Troopers going to be getting called in. Clan Eden baiting out the nuke. And he sees... Well, Stealth Tanks are here. Sam Sites are here. Dune Tiger's pretty well prepared for this. Zone Heads are amazing, but only if they can avoid uh, directly engaging with anti-air. They aren't really... Uh, good versus stuff that kills them quickly. Uh, Dune Tiger playing SimCity more than playing Command and Conquer. It's sort of in the name. You're supposed to command and then conquer, not simulate the prettiest city of every Nod building, of every Nod upgrade, of the every Nod unit. But that is what Dune Tiger is doing. Bike Rush Owns isn't doing much different. Mm, Bloodhound's getting called in as well. Why not? Uh-oh. Dune Tiger calls something in directly on top of this army. Possibly a tip vapor bomb. Yep. He gets some zone troopers with it. The Redeemer steps forward, and the zone heads are going for the kill. But of course... Uh, or another, no, it's a mind drop on top of those zone heads, which of course doesn't do anything, but trying to shut down the bloodhounds, shut down the zone troopers on the ground, and those double beam avatars are indeed doing a good job of that. Stealth tanks and seeker tanks going to be engaging in the middle of the map. Is that what sound the stealth tank makes? It's not a stealth truck, though, so it doesn't really make that sound. This game is over. Even Baby Burt knows that this game is weird at this point. Plan Eden and Monster Tamer might be able to pull something out of this. And uh, if they do, it's definitely Bike Rushes and Dune Tiger's map to lose. They've kind of uh, used their nukes somewhat frivolously. They have not played particularly strategic. And they have not played particularly... Uh, well, by comparison to other maps. Oh, the RNG! Oh my gosh! Once again, the Redeemer completely escapes the Shockwave Artillery! A complete miss every single round, impacting nothing. Zoneheads cycling through the middle of the map, getting an easy kill on that Reckoner. Ooh, that's called coffee. You don't want that. And Dune Tiger, again, just camping out in his base, not doing anything, not pursuing, not attacking. That's water, yeah. Water and coffee, the essentials of casting a 2v2v2 tournament. This series started out with some pretty entertaining games with some pretty, you know, interesting attempts, and it has just turned into uh, the, the camping simulator. I mean, these guys are legitimately doing nothing.
Bike Rochones and Dune Tiger, who have pretty distinct army advantages and tech advantages with nukes, aren't pushing them, aren't utilizing them. They're just sitting there. At the same time, Monster Tamer for... Oh, he baits it! He baits Dune Tiger into... Well, actually, no, that was Monster Tamer. Maybe they planned that. But Monster Tamer and Plan Eden baited in the aircraft to try and use the supersonic airstrike to clean some of them up. It's a little bit like uh, if you're down 100 points in some kind of a sports ball game, if you get, like, the eighth best player on the other team ejected. That's a little bit what that's like. You didn't actually do anything to change the course of the game or to improve your own chance of winning. You just did a little bit to the other team. Like, ah, we got some Venoms. It's like, ah, what did you do against the 100 Avatar army? Nothing. What did you do against the 30 seconds left on that nuke? Nothing. Yeah, we killed some... We got the, like, 8th best guy ejected from the game. Yeah, you're still 100 points down, though. Stealth Tank's coming in. Bike Rush owns... Was he literally shooting the middle of the Tiberium field? I guess maybe the Redeemer dies, but it doesn't even because he doesn't have a scan, apparently. Did he just... So he does nuke Monster Tamer's base. 90 seconds left on Dune Tiger's nuke. No Ion Cannon, no Rift Generator from our team in the north. I called down the Tiberium Seed, so that's neat. To Ben Detonation fires off, kills some stuff. I wish we could see the in-game chat so that we knew if these guys were intentionally joking around with each other or uh, what the what the kind of, you know, vibe was in the game. It's like when you play against the easy AI and you're just, like, toying with it. Like, you let it rebuild a little bit and then you come in and smash all of its stuff. And it's like, at any moment, you can end the game. Do it. Kill one redeemer. Kill one redeemer. Just one redeemer. Hey, they got it. They traded almost every viable fighting unit that they have for it, but they killed a redeemer. All right. I guess they nuked up here again. Or he nuked his own base. Did a Vertigo just... No, oh, a Spectre is bombing nothing. Okay, that's what it is. I was like, did a Vertigo just bomb nothing? But no, it was a Spectre. All right, well, Monster Tamer has uh, has an Eradicator Hexpod. I guess he doesn't have a drone ship, so he can't build any power plants. Monster Tamer leaves the game. Plan Eden has everything. Delta tank. Uh, I guess sell off some of these refineries. Uh, I would say get the harvesters back to work, but they're not really doing anything, so... Like, there isn't a lot of Tiberium on the map. You could harvest this out in a couple of seconds. Get that back under your control. But, you know... So... I'm glad that these guys are uh, having fun. <laughs> these, these shadow teams in the in the sky. Where did the shadow teams go? Oh, they're gonna mass bomb. Yeah. If this is not, uh, you know, like 
like an, a, a known agreement between the players, then this is some pretty heavy uh, bad manners from Bike Rush and Dune Tiger. I assume that everyone is sort of on board with this, that they're not just toying with them in like a, in what would be a really humiliating way. Uh, I assume they're not just doing that. I assume everyone's in on the joke. Everyone's having a laugh about these last two games. Obviously, the first two were actually pretty legit games. Uh, the second two, I guess, no need for a uh, for a anti-spoiler. <laughs> Tip Catalyst missiles is revidery. Like, okay, you could kill everything that he has, but you tip Catalyst Missile the refinery. This is almost like uh, when you're playing one of those missions with an ally, and the AI ally is just, like, sitting around not doing anything, and you were given, like, four stealth teams, four shadow teams, and it's like you have to complete the mission with just the shadow teams, but your, a your ally has everything in the book. Oh! Hey, remember that redeemer that got killed? Yeah, I guess that was of no consequence. Uh, Plan Eden stuck one engineer inside of this Marv, so when the Vertigo bombers make a hundred bombing runs against the Marv, it will eventually uh, heal back up. Shatter teams kill absolutely everything. They're even force firing the power plant just to uh, just for the fun of it. Oh, okay. He got the tier three, so that's kind of funny. Not that that does anything, but it's kind of funny. Well, um... Doom Tiger heading out with a whole bunch of stealth tanks. Biker Jones fires off the Rage Gen, trying to save his Redeemer, I guess. Not that he cares about the Redeemer. The Redeemer goes down. Plan, Plan Eden kills another Redeemer. Uh, stealth tanks make their way to the base of Plan Eden. And I guess if this is a base race, then Plan Eden at least has this base over here. You can't build an MCV or anything out of it, but he's at least pretty well defended against aircraft. Uh, not that he's super well defended, but... Three minutes, 50 seconds on the Ion Cannon... The Ion Cannon can actually take a lot of stealth tank missiles before it finally dies. Yeah, based on the fact that Plan Eden is dropping, like, power plants directly in the face of these stealth tanks in that way, and that he went for the Ion Cannon like that. All right, Plan Eden has been defeated. There we go, folks. Bike Rashones and Dune Tiger advance to the semifinals. They will be playing Aggressive Panda and One Vision. And hopefully that is a legitimate series because the last two games here were bizarre. But you now the first part of this started normal and then it just transitioned into nonsense for no conceivable reason. But again, if these guys are all in a chat, if these guys are all goofing around, then the series was over and they knew it. And they just went out having a laugh and having a good time and that will be that. All right. That's the end of the quarterfinals. Thank you all very much for watching. A big thanks to David for sponsoring these three, four tournaments, really, for putting his own cash on the line and creating some really fantastic games that we've seen throughout the 1v1. Even the mid to beginner finals was great, but the 1v1, the 2v2 tournament, we're seeing some great games, and I'm sure the semifinals, the bronze match, and the finals, as well as the 3v3 tournament, will all be fantastic. And we'll get to see some more games, even if each individual game isn't great. There's no way with all the action left, with all the players left, that we're not going to see some great stuff. So that will do it. If you made it to the end of the video, thank you all very much for watching. Um, oh, if you made it to the end, tell me about something weird 
out of context that you heard or read, you know how sometimes, you know, like on a Reddit thread or something, the question is about X, Y, or Z, and then someone brings up something totally unrelated. Or when you're walking by someone, remember the outdoors, and it's like you hear something, tell me about something way out of context that you heard. Uh, there was no reason to watch the last, like, 50 minutes of this game because it's just been a waste of time. But that'll be it for this. Uh, yeah. This is Cyber signing out.